you know, I've got this forty thousand dollars laying around. And hey, I'm just, I'm just thinking. You know, rem with a parasol might be the thing to do. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's just me. I don't know. Mm. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I'm going to ask a question. Um, and is that <laughs> and I'll probably provide. Wait a minute. Is it after ten? <laughs> oh. oh, that's um, right. Okay. Yeah, and we, keep, we're talking family you know, friendly. These will probably be bought by either you know Elon Musk, um, as Johnny pointed out. Um, right. or, you know, some otaku who owns a store who's like, I want it, period, and I'm going to put it, you know, in, in the, the, the lobby. Um, here's a question. Understanding it would be absurdly expensive. Yeah. How much would you pay? <clears throat> For a life-size, mm -hmm. life-size, 5'2". Yeah. Rem. Mm-hmm. And the everything is fixed, so it's a solid. I'm I'm assuming it's like a fiberglass mold. I, I assume so. So it's, it's it's entirely fixed, beautifully painted, wonderful, mm -hmm. um, great display piece. Um, I I honestly I I wouldn't pay anything for it. Really? I uh, just I I have my Nendoroid Rem. Mm -hmm. And I have my Figma Max Factory rem. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. You know, the, the, the Nendoroid is sculpted exactly as it is. Mm -hmm. And the Max Factory is is awesome. It's got mm -hmm. all kinds of articulation, a little bits and things there. Mm -hmm. This thing is a giant hunk of fiberglass. True. And while that's really, really cool, you know, if I had 40000 bucks just sort of laying around like I could pull out of the couch – I, I still, I think I would find something better to use with that. Well, that that's, that's what I'm asking, though. You know, it could be a hundred dollars. Maybe you know. Now, if it was a hundred bucks, five two, mm -hmm. you know, fiberglass, all this sculpt for a hundred dollars. I I seriously think about that, but anywhere north of basically two fifty, mm. that's insane. And then anything south of 100, it's probably going to be made out of, like, you know, old cardboard and kind of weird stuff that it's not going to hold up. Mm. So it's just – it's not it's not a practical thing. Now, if I was a store owner, like if I owned the FYE or I owned, you know, whatever – any given number of mm. uh, comic, book, comic book shops that also trades in manga and anime stuff – I'd be, you know, that would be something that I'd I'd set down and and talk with my business partners and say, you know, geez, we're going to get a lot of traffic as soon as we announce this thing. Yep. We're going to get traffic like you wouldn't believe. Mm -hmm. So that's probably the best place to put it. Um, your average otaku, it's it's just so far beyond affordability. Oh sure, yeah. You know um... that it's just there's not there's not a quality that you can have at a price that somebody's going to be going to otaku wise throw out for it mm -hmm. now the you right know? stuff page does include a little more information there were actually 10 of these made in japan um seven have already been sold and basically right stuff got the chance was talking to the right person and is like can we sell the other three and they said yes um so there are already seven that that went um well, seven have been made i'll put it that way is the exact quote um, and three units remain available exclusively through Right Stuff Anime for custom order. Um, we also point out these are handmade. They kind of have to be, right? Like, there's the no detail giant of stamp. that picture. Doom. Yeah. Um, uh, and so as a result, each one will technically be unique. Right? Well, see, and that's the thing that, that interests me. It's, I, I had experience with fiberglass and fiberglass molding. So if Rem is a fiberglass figure, mm -hmm. what you're seeing of the exterior, that you have to paint that on the mold first. Mm. So you hit, it, you hit it with a clear coat in the mold, and then you have to put all the detailing in, and then you layer in the resin mm. and the fiberglass matting. So, so according to this, it is, so, sorry, according to this, by the way, it is apparently fiberglass reinforced plastic. I don't know if that changes anything. It might not particularly because okay. I mean, what? How do you define resin? Mm. You know, what I mean, resin once it cures and it cures, you know, at temperature, 
it becomes a plastic. Mm, mm-hmm. So yeah. you know what I mean. And it's like the easiest thing to do when you're when you're producing a figure of that size mm-hmm. is you have a master mold, and then you clear coat that so you have something that releases from the mold, mm-hmm. and then you do all your coloration, all your all your detailing. Then you layer in all your support materials, mm. and then you slap the thing together and go from there. Mm-hmm. Um, arguably, you could create a a master blank, and then oh, literally hand paint each thing, which would be so wow. You, well, they it's it's three D printed. They actually have photos on oh here. Oh my god! Um, it, they have these large three D printers that that are printing at you piece by piece. Large. The freaking yeah. thing would be huge. Well, I mean, they're, they're printing dozens of pieces. Um, Damn. Uh, according to the but the in color, in no, all no. the colors, no, no, detail no, no, or no. just a blank, P- uh, plain white. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then they are assembled. I'm. Uh, it shows him. Yeah, uh, fiddling with the stuff. Uh, there is a mostly assembled figurine. Um, and then it looks okay. Now I say that. Well, no, I think those are painted. Hard to tell. Um, I'm seeing some of the other pieces, and they are colored, but it looks like they've actually been spray-painted. Yeah, they've definitely been spray-painted, um, mm. or otherwise painted. Mm. Um, wow, they actually have a photo of a the souvenir Akihabara store, where this life-size rem is sitting in there, you know, at, in the front of the uh, the, 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 the thing. Um, that looks damn gorgeous. Like, if I was running a store, I, I don't, as folks are saying in chat, I don't know if it, it is wise to buy it. I don't know if it would make financial sense to buy it. I would definitely want to buy it. Well, you know, I mean, that's oh, where are we are. There we go. Sorry, yeah. sorry, it zipped out there for a second. Yeah. Um, I, you know, if you've got forty grand laying around, then that's that's fine. You know, that's that's as a business, that's a great decision. Mm-hmm. But as an otaku, I, oh yeah, this is good, and it's not again. It's not ten o'clock. I would I would like a rem whereby I can have her in her sailor uniform. Mm-hmm. I can have her in her kimono. I, you, you know what I mean? It's like uh, interactive. An interactive figure mm-hmm. would be more um, cost efficient. Mm-hmm. And $40,000 is not. And so... yes, Kira, bikini rem. Yeah, that would, yeah. <laughs> but we're not going to go there because it's 945 here on the East Coast. So we're not saying things like that. So in case folks are wondering, I've, I've just thrown up an image of, of what this looks like. Um, and uh, oh, wow. Yeah. God. That's that's kind of amazing. That is definitely kind of amazing. Um, now, I might consider paying 40000 for that entire display. <laughs> right, exactly. All the lanterns <laughs> behind, the little the little metal whole thing, I, you know, mm-hmm. I, I, arguably. Yeah. But, uh, you know, jeez. Uh, mm-hmm. Um, I yeah. think he's in a shopping mall, by the way. Um, folks are asking. Um, but yeah, it's... Mm. Ah, 40,000. 40, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's funny. It almost sounds like um, like it was made for some event. Like, there, you know, th- there was some big thing for ReZero, and they're like, let's just make a bunch of these, and, you know, every participating store will get one of these to set out, you know, on display um and they're like we only need seven let's make ten you know and then sell the other three who knows but in living in the time of covid that's easily possible mm-hmm. you know that they had a series of events that they were they were going to do something with um wasn't i mean they released the director's crut uh, crut <laughs> the director's cut of ray zero mm-hmm. and then the next season of ray zero um is on the way or or going i'm not sure which um so you know i mean that would that would all perfectly tie in with the with you know media events and other things going on for for you know public events but uh covid Mm -hmm. yeah that might leave you easily with a handful of these things where it's like well now we got nothing so let's do what we can generate some cash out of it and see what happens yeah 125 pounds is not easy to ship um no it, and and Rice I've mentioned it, it comes in a crate like a a six foot tall crate will show up at your door, you know, with with a, ray, a a rem figure you know inside, 
Um, I wonder. I wonder if they have a sense of humor about it. So like, <laughs> it shows up in a giant crate, and it has like a body bag sort of tag <laughs> on the ex the exterior of it. Be like, yes, your body's here. I'd be like, oh god, no. I, I I think you would have a long time going through customs if you did that. You think? <laughs> I'm just. I'm. I'm assuming that the given the linear proportions of the figure that the mm -hmm. picture you showed mm -hmm. i'm gonna guess that the parasol must be in parts I, I think i suspect the parasol is actually removable like you just slide it out of her hands and then that yeah but do you think it's next to her do you think it's a real parasol it, it, or do you think it, it is they say it is actually a traditional like they, they've sourced a traditional okay. japanese handmade parasol I was going to say, because you're shipping a coffin, having something that's a giant round thing is not doesn't really fit in a coffin very well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, that, yeah, well, that's see, sure for, your, for your $40,000, you get a lovely traditional exactly. parasol. Yes. That um, makes it all. That that thing alone is worth $39,999. Right. Sadly, you know, the, the, not eligible for promotional discounts. Damn. I know. You can't save five oh, bucks. Off your uh, forty thousand. Now wait a minute. If I if I use DHL, I can get a ten percent discount Ooh, on shipping. Yeah. <laughs> Ship shipping. Mm -hmm. So I'm still gonna have to pony up a hell of a lot of money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. um, I do wonder. Let's see here. Um, and yes, ah, gorilla, I'm, I'm not. Gorilla was saying I look like I'm using a Game Boy camera. No, this <laughs> this is what happens when you're trying to stream like live and bandwidth is not infinite. Mm -hmm. So, um, wow! The total weight of the crate and figure is three hundred eleven pounds. Whew. Um, <laughs> Damn. Yeah, and can only be shipped to the U.S. because of licensing, right? Uh, like they say, um, due to licensing and contract, contract restrictions, this product can be sold and shipped to North America only. Because I'm sure, again, there are seven of them in Japan that are going to particular places, and they're like, we're not going to cross the streams. Like that's, yeah. I give you, I give you six months before you have that ship directly from China <laughs> to the U.S. for a mere five thousand dollars. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And, no. and well, you know, I not, not to say that 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 that's you know that's right necessarily, but mm -hmm. again, this is one of those things we talked about before. Very specific Chinese copyright and trademark mm -hmm. regulations say if you are not filed in the completely, you know, filled out forms, cross T's, dotted I's, et cetera, kanji, you know, hiragana, katagana, whatever, that those things are totally legit. Mm -hmm. You can go ahead and do entirely that. Maybe that's my way of getting a $200 <laughs> giant rem. <laughs> oh! <laughs> going to jail dad yeah. yeah it's it's interesting um it's a thing yeah so anime um <laughs> so if you're not going to buy the forty thousand dollar figurine will you go to the virtual maid cafe that's the question i am going to tune into fun con next weekend okay mm -hmm. yeah, so the, so the funimation con i'm gonna i'm gonna tune in because i'm curious mm -hmm. to see what's going on yeah I know GalaxyCon has just been going absolutely bananas with stuff. Mm. They have had um, Voyager cast. They've had Deep Space Nine cast. Mm. They've had it, it, they had Shatner. They've got uh, uh, next a lot of the next gen cast. Mm. So they, you know, I mean, I'll, this has really been the thing where it's like, you know, Brent, you should have copyrighted trademark on Con and everything related to online cons. If that only... would have made you. A, a trillionaire. If only that's how copyright works. Right, yeah, I know. It's just a shame because, you know, you really could have made Bezos your, like, houseboy. <laughs> Be like, Bezos, get me a coffee. Yo, Gates, go over there and mm -hmm. fix that. Do that thing. I, I'm, I'm reading um, Steve Alpert's book about doing business in Japan. And he says the weirdest thing is getting used to the fact that in America, you know, you, um, you sign a contract and you obey the contract. Um, and... Um, if you agree to something, like you've agreed to that, right? Like that's, if, if, as long as you've said the words and made it clear that that's what you want to do, that, that's, that's your word. He said, in Japan, routinely, people will promise things and then just never deliver them. Um, and routinely, folks will just say, oh, yeah, we, we have a warehouse to do that, and they have no warehouse. Um, what's 
important is the relationship. It is so people will will say all sorts of things that are not true yet, um, or are not technically true. Um, but as long as you are maintaining a good relationship, and as long as that relationship works out, and as long as you like deliver on the important stuff, no one really cares if you lie. So oh it's God. really weird. Um, and he said it's, it's common in Asia too. Like it is just, it is apparently just a thing. Um, and he said so. He he would watch the head of Takuma, uh, Takuma Shoten, the uh, the uh, parent company the Studio Ghibli is under, just get up and just talk about all these things that he knew wasn't true, and everyone would just stand there and go, mm hmm, mm hmm, mm hmm, mm hmm, mm hmm, you know. And it would or it wouldn't happen. And uh, life goes on. Hi, I'm the president of Bakari Sweat, <laughs> and not only is our drink refreshing and delicious and a slight grapefruity kind of flavor, but it'll make you fly, <laughs> which might or might not be true. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, that's that's fun. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Let's see. How much would that like get you in, like, out of business in the U.S.? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, it'll make you taller. Well, it'll grow your hair. It'll and, be awesome. <laughs> like, and, and, really? and he said, in, in, in fairness, he was working with Harvey Weinstein. That's a whole other thing. Um, <laughs> who was, uh, uh, and this is during Princess Mononoke, who was okay. trying to get voice talent for Princess Mononoke. And every week he'd call and say, oh, yeah, Leonardo DiCaprio is going to do Achitaka. And, oh, yeah, this person is going to do San or whatever. And it turns out, like, he may have like sent Leonardo DiCaprio a voicemail and that meant Leonardo DiCaprio was definitely going to do it. And you know, a month later, no, he wasn't going to do it. Somebody else was. So Steve, poor Steve Albert would get up like every month in a business meeting to explain what was going on and would say, you know, in February, Leonardo DiCaprio is going to play Ashitaka. Oh, good. Oh, that's really good. A month later, you know, George Clooney is going to play Ashitaka. Oh, good, good, good. No one ever asked what happened to Leonardo DiCaprio. No one ever asked, like, why none of these things were actually coming true. Just, oh, good. That sounds good. You know, moving on. Um, just, you know, in fairness, like, a lot of American business works that way, too. Where it's like, oh, yeah, it, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. It's like, mm. Yeah, we, we've got all these A-list people going to play stuff. And by the way, the dude who sanitizes the telephones and the uh, door handles, he's actually doing most of the voice work. But that's only after <laughs> negotiations really didn't go very well. I'm like, oh, okay. Hey, as long as that works for you, that's fine. Um, I'm, I'm still the, the Loudman common. Yeah. I'm, you know... I, I, I'm not in on that to understand what the whole – like, the whole presentation you did is, like, it's to understand the loudman <laughs> or loud, loud, loudman, whatever the hell the word is. Um, I, 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 I'm at a loss for that. I don't, I don't understand it now. So does this show actually explain to me what that is that I can understand it? Because that, that would be really helpful. Yes. Yeah, here's the problem. I, I I feel like I'm an old man now, you know, talking about some project probably everyone else knows about, right? And just never filtered up to me. Like I'm sure this is some big deal, some major, you know, deal. Um, and just I I have no clue. I don't know what this is. I don't know why that would be a thing. Um, and it sounds like something that makes a lot of sense to his fans. Um, well, see, now, now, see, this is the part where we can get uh, Kira to chime in yeah. as the dude, dude on the street. <laughs> is is Loudman like this thing that is a cultural phenomena that we here in the U.S. are just we just not tuned in yet, or is this literally, literally like one of those uh, B movie kind of promoters? It's the biggest thing. It's going to be everything. Everybody's going to say Loudman. They're going to all say. Where's Loudman? What's happening with Loudman? <laughs> like, you okay? No, um, not necessarily. I am currently uh, going. Um, so, yeah, so I'm, I'm sorry draw. to hear that you're currently going. <laughs> um, uh, so, let's see here. Uh, yeah, character designer or director, oh. actually. Whoops. Um, damn it. No, that's me. I keep hitting the damn wrong thing. Sorry. No My bad. My bad. Um, he directed and produced an, an ONA called uh, Yumi Gasameru Made, or Before You Wake Up, uh, which is a one-episode ONA of um, 
um, looks like a minute long. It's basically a music video kind of a thing, or a short film. Um, I also did a thing called Cosmos Trailer, uh, which is two minutes long. Um, so I'm a, so, and again, I don't know. Um, definitely comes across like a independent animation filmmaker, right? Um, doing some work here and there. Uh, also worked on, um, what is this? Uh, he was a character designer. Oh, yeah, yeah. This, he did the art for I Want to Eat Your, your Pancreas. Um, which was fairly well um, uh, received, what I understand. Was um, he the main art well, designer? I think he did, like, the, I, was he, I, what, I, I mean, what was his interaction with um, I, that to make him? I think he basically drew the cover. So you know how you know light novels will have the art on the cover and the, and the illustrations and so forth? I think that's what right. he did for the original novels. And so he's like the original character designer, like the character designer, like the um, Harui Suzumiya. The original light novels had like that art in there of the characters. That, that is the original character designer, technically, of Haruhi and so forth. And Kyoani did their own adaptations of those character designs. Okay, so he's got more cred than just necessarily uh, one minute and two minutes worth mm -hmm. of like content. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, uh -huh. He's also done several manga. Um, okay. 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 So it looks like. Um, like uh, his or manga. illustrated others? Um, does it say? Looking now, uh, looks like he's mainly illustrating others. Uh, two of them, he did the art, one he, story and art with another writer. Mm -hmm. um, okay. To collaboration there. Um, so this looks and like. And I'm not dissing. Yeah. I'm, and don't get me wrong, I'm not yeah. dissing on the dude. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just. But it's just when I see something that's like you know, somebody I'm, I'm not immediately familiar with and they make a big announcement about things that are coming and, you know, mm -hmm. stuff that's happening. It's, it makes me wonder. It's like, have you got the cred to back this up? That's <laughs> like, this is a, this is the momentum that you've got off of like this groundswell. And it's yeah. like, here I am, I'm exploding. Or is it you sitting in your little, little studio area with your light board and you're going, you know, I'm going to have to do this. I'm just, I'm going to go crazy with this and we'll see what mm -hmm. happens. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so he does look like he has, and just looking through some of the um, uh, like comments on, on Mao, he does look like he's the kind of person who has a... Um, okay, he looks like he's Makoto Shinkai before he made his movies, right? Like he's an artist doing interesting stuff, sort of pushing, you know, moving along, doing some independent stuff. Um, but just, you know, okay. hasn't had the opportunity to do anything really big yet. Um, and people seem to, like, really dig now, his style. Shin... Well, in Shinkai's time, did he do the same kind of thing where, like, he did some bits and pieces here and there and then self-promoted and it's sort of like an explosion out to be like, here I am. Yeah, because he did um, The Rain, The Girl, and My Letter, I think, which is a five-minute um, short animation. Uh, very okay. limited, very, very basic. Um, and then I forget what other art, and then I think he was doing like other art stuff, just like illustrations here and there, um, while he was doing Voices of Innocent Star. Um, okay. And of course that was his big thing. Okay. So this, stuff made. so, so this arc, this arc of his, uh, career is not unprecedented. It's not just somebody who's mm -hmm. just a shameless self promoter, right. but he's actually, he's got the chops to bring it up. Okay. That's, that's cool. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Kudos um, to him. That's, that's yeah, awesome. I'm, I'm looking for it. And, and now that I've seen some of the, the stuff, so it's L-O-U-N-D-R-A-W, if anyone's curious. Um, you know, Google it and, and take a look at the, at the art style and kind of the approach. Lounge and, draw. Yeah, so I hope I hope it works out. Um, looks like an interesting uh, interesting approach. Def I, I also wonder, if you're an artist and you draw, you know, anime girls, cute anime girls, how do you stand out from the crowd? How do you take a thing to the next level? I would argue one of the good ways of doing that is to say, I'm going to do a multimedia project where I'm going to try to kind of define my style. I'm going to try to figure out what it is that makes me unique and put that into this project. Fans come along with me. This could be a really, you know, a, a, a clever kind of new media way of, of getting people's attention and doing something that uh, is not the norm. Well, Brent, it's, uh, it's 10.02 on the East Coast. Mm-hmm. So I'm just going to head and say it. Okay. You want to differentiate yourself differentiate yourself here, here for, for other people? Naked people. 
That's 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 how you do it. Naked people. That's see, I don't know anymore. Well, there are degrees of naked people. I'm not yeah. going to go into that because it's only just ten o two. If it was like two a.m., <laughs> then 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 uh, uh, geek archaeology late after dark. Mm. Then we could go into greater detail, but <laughs> naked people, yeah, and beach scenes, and mountain camping. See, that's the thing. I I I honestly think that is becoming. I don't want to say passe, but I think there is enough of a reaction against that. Oh stuff. yeah, it is extremely passe. Yeah. No, no. Look at how many people complain about beach scenes. Yeah, yeah, for good damn reason. They're in everything. Even like serious. I uh, God, was it blood, blood, blood or blood? Blood C? plus. Blood plus. I don't know. I think there's even some 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 beachy things because I saw there was um. There was a discussion about what was horror, horror anime, mm. and one of the things it showed an image. What I swear it looked like people were in bathing suits, and I'm like, really? <laughs> so it's a horror, and you guys still have a beach scene? Mm -hmm. Uh come on! Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's it. like you know, that's not uh, that's that's you know just shameless fan service, mm -hmm. and I totally get it. Again, as we've discussed so many times, money. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You you want people to a tune in mm -hmm. and b um, hobby link. Uh, uh, I no. Uh, there's a certain online vendor mm. that I get constant like advertisements from, mm. and everybody from K on is in bikinis. Mm -hmm. Everybody from Idolmaster oh, yeah. is in bikinis. Mm -hmm. Everybody from Ray Zero. You pick you know uh, Konosuba. Mm -hmm. Everybody, whether there is a beach scene or not, right. is all in bikinis. Right. So it's like, okay, I, I, I get it. Figures that are of these characters, they sell in bikinis. So, you know, an easy out to get people to tune in is any given, you know, series. Throw a bikini scene, a beach scene in, and that just, that's just, that's solid. You're good to go. How many Ghibli characters have you seen in bikinis in figurines? Ponyo. And even then, Ponyo, I think she, I think she's wearing a, she's wearing like a one piece, yeah, little frilled bathing suit, and then she's like the fish. So, mm -hmm. it's, mm. um, the male character has a pair of swim trunks, but I'm, you know, mm, that's that's yeah. that's that's pretty normal looking. Mm -hmm. That's not like a risque particularly. I don't think I've ever seen a Makoto Shinkai character in a bathing suit or in like a bikini. Yet. <laughs> Somebody out there has done it, and I, and that's the thing might is I, be, might not be Shanghai, but it's somebody out there has done it. Yeah, I, I I totally agree that, you know, the received wisdom, right, is you got to do the etchy stuff. Um, I think it's smart for him to not do that, for him to not go down that road. Maybe he has, I don't know, um, but I think one way to well, differentiate I, I, yourself I, is I, to say I'm not going to go there. I applaud anyone that doesn't take that easy out that goes you know the mm -hmm. extra distance to you because you know cute characters in cute outfits somebody will watch mm -hmm. but you know gr grinding through mm -hmm. a a solid storyline and just you know delivering the goods mm -hmm. and not having to do that and still having people be like oh my god i love that character i can't get enough of it mm -hmm. it's like yeah, that's yeah. the kind of story story we want. <laughs> I've talked about Lane in the past and how one of the most amazing things about Lane is they never sexualize their characters, right? Lane never shows up in a revealing outfit. Um, see, the, uh, the girls go to the, a club at one point where they're wearing, like, you know, clubbing clothes. Um, but besides yeah, but that, that's... you know, yeah, it, it's, you know, it, it's nothing nothing crazy. Uh, and they just, like, so deliberately refuse to sexualize that character. So wait a minute, my my one six scale lane in a in a bikini is <laughs> isn't isn't like from the series? Maybe no. just saying. No, 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 it is not. <laughs> well, that's like the Junji Ito stuff. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like there's somebody who, I you know, if you see a bikini, it's going to be somebody who's like probably been chewed in half. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it's going to be the top and the bottom laying on a different side. Yeah, and you know what I mean. Or it's like the integrity of the of the story and what they're getting at is the bikini is just beach scene 
mountain scene is just uh, so it's pointless. It's, it's funny. I just watched. Um, let me see if I got this right. Um, um, an episode of Naoki Urasawa no Manben, which I don't know if you talked Gesund. about in the past. Yes. Gesundheit. Um, <laughs> so this is an amazing uh, show. Um, yep, yeah, Jujito. Um, so basically, Naoki Urasawa, famous mangaka, um, 20th Century Boys, Pluto, Monster, um, trying to think of others. Um, uh, Monster as in the one that's the doctor yeah, and the... that's him. Um, Master okay, Keaton, okay, gotcha. uh, a couple others. Um, he basically he he does a, an NHK TV series where they um, analyze a particular mangaka, and okay. and and he he says in the first episode he got kind of he he realized a while back that nobody's actually documenting manga as an art form, in the sense of how does that artist do that. Right, like, how does uh, the guy who does Judges with our adventure ha- bring that dynamism to those characters or whatever? So what they do, um, a film crew comes in, and they install cameras in the manga studio, and they sit in there for like three days. Um, the crew is all in another room, while they just have controls to all these cameras, and they just film this person for like three days drawing manga. So the film crew doesn't have to actually interact with the person. They can just do their thing in silence, essentially, you know, no distractions. And they film all this and they can zoom in as, as the person's just sketching and, and doing pens and so forth. And then that's not even the show. Now Kurosawa and the mangaka then go someplace, sit down and watch the footage of that together and discuss how the mangaka does what they do. Yeah, oh. yeah. So it's like I noticed That's there cool. that you're like doing this thing with your with your hand. What is that? Oh yeah, the way I get like these really delicate lines is I have to do this. Oh, so you hold the pen this, you know, and it's just that forty five minutes of this. It's amazing. And wow. one of the episodes of the last season is Junji Ito. Ooh, yes. Okay. And they talk they talk about the connection between horror and eroticism in the sense that you often see you know um uh uh you know that you um, a you often get you know topless girls and so forth in horror um but like why is like why do those things um connect and and i think it's or, or it's one of the two says there is an interesting connection between um the sort of raw emotions of horror and that sense of um the 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 raw emotions of eroticism that there is this connection not connection but there is this kind of um relationship or relatedness to the idea that um when you're looking at something that is horrific there is a there has to be some kind of not attractiveness to it but some kind of interest to it that that is making you look at it. Curiosity. Exactly. Yes. And that those two things kind of work in. He, he talks about, or or, or Sawa says, you always have really like cute girls in your stories. You always have attractive female characters in your story. You know, the vast majority of them. And he says, right. yes, I have to, because I have to, because that counteracts the horror. If I don't have that beauty, then it's just all horror, and people won't read it. But by having an attractive character in there, it makes the horror more horrible. Well, didn't you show some some time ago a, a, a or discussed a uh, a bit of it was blood plus or blood C whatever the hell it is, but with the um, the monsters that rampage through the class, and they is that the hmm. one where it's like there's a big animal with lots of arms and it pulls a person apart is that blood i i don't i've not seen that i'm, I'm not sure uh, what about. i'm i'm thinking of the image well it's yeah. I, i'm seeing the video clip in my mind mm-hmm. and it's a thing that looks like a large panther okay but imagine it being like 
10 feet tall, and it's got two arms out of its back. Okay. And it grabs a girl in a short skirt. Okay. And you see, you know, I hope I'm, I'm wrong, so it's not a spoiler. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you, you, you see it pick her up, and it picks her up upside down. Uh-huh. And her skirt falls towards mm-hmm. her head. And then it wishbones her. Ah. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> You know, it's just like, oh. mm. it. you know what I mean? It's like, so I, I, huh, I get yeah. the, the, the cuteness and the horror thing involved because it's just like, oh, she's, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> like, ah! So, well, it's, it's like interesting. Um, it's high interesting. School of the Dead, which I think we talked about before. Have you seen High School of the yeah. Dead? I've seen enough of it to the point where I got to hug the girl I loved. And I killed my best friend. Mm. And I'm like, oh, schmaltz. <laughs> Out the hell the door. Nope. Done. Thank you. Um, Blood Seed. Okay. Thank you. Um, so um, um, that was my problem with um, thank High you, School Johnny. of the Dead. Yes. That High School of the Dead does that. Like, they de- definitely intersperse sexiness with horror. But for, for me, yeah. for some reason, because I think, I think because the sexiness is so blatant, because it's so in your face... Um, it it did not contrast well. Um, for me, there was just something about the fact that it, it felt um, kind of like we were talking about before. Oh, of course the character has a bikini you know, figure. Of course there's a cast out version of the figure. Um, it just felt like they were they were um, um, it didn't feel sufficiently subtle or sufficiently woven into the narrative. To kind of evoke that right. reaction, it's just that that's out of place, right? But it's interesting that it it does. There is that those sort of those two sides of it. Well, it's one of those things. that's like you see um, from Shirbako mm. and Kagushigoto this this mm. this current season, mm-hmm. where they discuss editors. Now, Shirbako, you 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 see how a lot of other things are flying around in the in the sort of sphere. Kagushigoto. The editor is genuinely sort of played down, mm-hmm. but I, you know, you can easily envision, and again, one more time, money, mm-hmm. that you would have somebody who is the you know representative of some of the of the company that says, you know, this is brilliant, this is a great story, readers love it. Is there a possibility that we could have somebody flip their skirt? Yeah, mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Because we th- we oh, yeah. think that might get a little bit more sale. Um, mm-hmm. Do you think that at the end of this, you know, you've got this great big arc, and there's so much going on, it's so intensely, intensely emotional. Mm-hmm. Do you think you could just like pop in there where it's they they're they're taking a second to like recoup, and they go to the beach? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, what I mean, I I, oh, yeah. I kind of get. I, I get where that comes from because mm-hmm. that's, you know, hopefully it's done in a, you know, respectful way. It's like, wow, you're doing such great work. And, you know, why don't we just dial this back and then stretch this out for the readers? Mm-hmm. You know, Dragon Ball Z, how how long can you charge up, <laughs> you know, a Kamehameha or a, or a spirit bomb before, you know, four episodes later, before, you know, <laughs> getting on with it. Um you know that stretches you out in what the things that you can produce and the, and mm-hmm. the things that you can earn money off of. So it's like I, I get all that, but sure. oh, it, famously, mm. there are certain manga, certain shonen manga, that are written at least as much by the editor as by the mangaka. You know, because the editor is coming in saying, um, and a lot of times the mangaka is is more or less. It, it's it's more or less the publisher saying, hey, you know. Our slate needs a ninja manga. Will you do a ninja right. manga, right? Um, and so the you know the, the, it, it's the editor who says, "Now here's what's hot right now." Like you know, do you have a you know kick-ass preteen girl in? Because that's that's popular. You should put that into your you know thing. You know they're they're Mad- looking at all these trends. Madaka box right there. <laughs> well, and, and here's a question that that I Brent as you as as sensei. Mm-hmm. Um, that I don't know. I've never, I've never looked into. Mm. But does a mangaka necessarily generate the story? Is that the definition of a mangaka, or can yeah. you have somebody who is a story writer mm. that the 
editor, you know, the the, the publishing house says, "Damn, this this is hot property," mm-hmm. and goes and says, "Brent, you're a manga artist. Mm-hmm. Here's this hot property, okay. and we like your style. Mm-hmm. So now just just do all this." Yeah. Oh, and that, then, then you yeah. you do it in your style, and then they come back and they say, "Well, that's okay, Brent. We love your style, except for you know these mm-hmm. six pages. Mm-hmm. We need this to be different." Yep. It's like, is that a thing, or do mangaka like are they story generators yeah. as well? Where it's like, when somebody comes back and says, "I need to change page six, and you're like, "Hell no! This is, that's just <laughs> exactly the way it goes. What do you want?" So it varies. Tell me. Um, and it, it varies based on seniority. Shocker. Um, <laughs> Go figure that. Yeah. Um, so from what I understand, and, and again, it, it varies by publisher, it varies by artist, all that kind of stuff. But the typical process is. You submit your um, your manga submission to Shonen Jump, right? And every month they get a thousand submissions from you know kids across the country, and they winnow them down, and you know one of them gets featured and, and, and shows up. Um, and so your your manga your 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 one shot you know your single issue thing gets published in Shonen Jump. Yay! Congratulations! Here's your you know twenty thousand yen or whatever. Um, and this is story and this, this, pictures. Yeah, this is completely this is, original. This is it has to be so. This is original. not. This is not just some kid saying, "Look, I can draw stuff," and then sending it to Shonen Jump. No, it, no, and, and and that's part of the thing is you're you are proving that you could be Akira Toriyama, that you could be whoever, that you you have the chops to do a Shonen Jump, you know, story. But then here's what mm-hmm. happens: uh, the publisher comes to you and says, "That was great. You're a great talent." Um, we're, we're definitely going to work with you in the future. Here's what we're looking for. We're looking f- we, we would love to publish a um, slice of life story about four girls. Um, one of them's, you know, um, uh, a bit of a klutz. One of them's serious and the other two are up to you. Do you want to do that? that? Does that interest you? Uh, okay. We're just in kind of, we can also kind of this more action-y thing of we're interested in doing that. And here's the thing. If you refuse, they'll go, oh, okay. Thank you. And walk away. And um, the, they're, get, they're getting these concepts from... From the editor. From, from research the or... Oh, um, from, from a variety of places. Um, it, it is... Sometimes it is... And again, this is something that no one talks about, but just sort of um, yeah, understanding through context. Um, but some of it is, you know... Um, we want our magazine to feature this breadth of material. And, you know, all of our mangaka have been pushing for this and we want to kind of broaden ourselves to do other stuff. You know, or, you know, we've always had a Magical Girl story and the Magical Girl mangaka has stopped her Magical Girl story and she's going on to something else. We need a Magical Girl story. Whatever. Um, all these various things. Okay. Or, or, in many cases, like, exactly to your point, it's... Fantasy's hot right now. Isekai's hot right now. We need an Isekai story. Somebody do an Isekai story for us. So, um, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I see that. Yeah. Um, so th- that's the thing is that your first thing is usually much more dictated by the publisher to a you know not down to every single detail, but they'll say here's what we're looking for you know generally, and then if you prove yourself with that, and that does well. Great. Then the next thing, you can either come to them or you have more freedom with, with your concept. Depends on how often things go. So, you know, you may do a thing and it flops within, a, you know, two months. So you're like, all right, we're trying something else. You do this for us. If you do that first thing and it's successful and that goes for a couple of years, then your next thing you have a lot more freedom in. So it's all of those things back and forth. Um, now, given the, uh, given the salary man concept at least as far <clears throat> back as the 80s and early 90s you know sort of before everything went to crap in a hand basket mm-hmm. um where you could hook in with a company and then they might even send you to the punishment room <laughs> to you till you can redeem yourself mm-hmm. but they wouldn't get rid of you they'd right. make it bad enough that you might leave mm-hmm. but they wouldn't necessarily get rid of you mm-hmm. when you get hooked in as a manga cop Mm-hmm. Is that in that context? Are you in like Flynn, so that mm. your thing your thing runs for a year and it was 
It was profitable. It wasn't super mm-hmm. great. It wasn't super terrible, but it was it was profitable enough. So then they then now say, we've got, you know, your story, that was fine. We've got somebody else's story who mm-hmm. your artwork was popular. Sure. So now that you're in, mm-hmm. you're going to just be, you're going to be a salary man for us. You're going to do this thing. You're going to crank out this product. Mm-hmm. That kind of thing? So, or not than that? Um, there's some, there, there is some complexity there. Uh, before I get to that, I want to address... Und- undoubtedly. <laughs> um, something Johnny pointed out in the chat room. Absolutely true. Um, the magazines are not necessarily bad guys here. Again, if, if you're publishing a, a Magical Girl series and some random person has published a very nice one-shot, they're still unproven. You don't know if they can handle the long term. It is totally reasonable for you to come in and say, you know... And, and the other th- side of the coin is... I'm going to be frank. Most of these submissions are terrible. Even the ones that get accepted are usually terrible. Um, and like Mangaka admit this. They said, my first thing was horrible. I went through all sorts of you know, terrible things. So this is a, um, a learning process, right? And the Mangaka is, is being trained up in the way he should go, Proverbs 3, 2, by the editor, you know, um, to kind of understand the business. Um, so it, it is, it, you know... Um, uh, and it's why it gets com- complicated about, you know, kind of, who's the author? I, yeah. um, um, so the the thing is, and the, the reason it, it gets popular is actually partly because of... Shigeru Mizuki! It got popular because Brent, Brent left. No, wait, what? <laughs> wait a minute. Kitaro? Yes. Gege no Kitaro? Yes. So, here's the thing. I'm, um, I'm, I'm on, like, episode 42 of oh, yeah. Kitaro from, from, like, last season, and it just won't end. Oh, it's no, on like, yeah. It's on, like, 70 now, and I'm like, just kill me. <laughs> but go ahead. Yes. Um, Take it, no Kitaro. So, Kitaro, um, when uh, Mizuki started this, he started Kitaro for some publisher, and back then, um, the publisher owned the manga. Flat out. Whatever manga was being published by the publisher, the manga owned the rights. Period. Um, so now, they bought it flat out, like a like buying a, a book. Yep. Yeah, whatever, whatever so they you, bought mm-hmm. the manga, the mm-hmm. rights, you, title, you, you everything all, to all it. it. Mm-hmm, exactly. Now, oh, you know, this is like the Harmony Gold kind of thing, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Now, um, here's huh. the thing. Like so many things, this was um, mm, contracts Terrible. were vague. <laughs> <laughs> um, contracts were, you know, we, you know, we have the rights to this thing, whatever. But it wasn't really spelled out in detail. Um, so at one point, the publisher came into Shigeru Mizuki and said, we don't want to pay you anymore. So we're firing you and hiring somebody cheap to draw Gegege no Kitaro. Goodbye. Um, and he was So you, you can get fired from your own yeah. stuff. Oh, yeah. Because it wasn't his stuff. It was the publisher's stuff. Um, oh, God. So he marched well, this over. Is, this is, isn't this exactly like laugh o Films and mm. uh, Oswald the Lucky Rabbit? Even better. He then mm. went over to the, to another publisher who said, you know, this is this sucks. I want to draw something for you. And depending on, on kind of the version you hear, um, either he or the publisher said, just draw Kitaro for me. Just do it. What can they do? They can't prevent it from happening. They they can't prevent the the books from existing. Um, let's just let's just do it. It's you know you created these characters. You 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 deserve to do it. Um, so he started publishing a rival version of Gekigen no, no Kitaro, saying this this is the manga from my heart. This is the thing that I created that you all love. You should read oh my, my version. And <laughs> sure enough, people were like. Those jerks in that first company, how dare they fire Mizuki from his own thing? And this became a big, you know, crisis. And so he was eventually hired back by the original publisher. Um, and so this is one of many stories. This is not the thing that caused it. But this wow. was one of the, the sort of um, big notable cases where, folks, where publishers realized, we can't get away with this. Like, we can't just, you know, claim ownership of this because the authors can... can can, in the court of public opinion, just run roughshod over us. So what happens is your first thing or your first your early things are generally owned more or less by the publisher, even today. 
So, and, and they'll negotiate that in the contract saying, this is your first thing. We're, we're trying things out. You'll certainly get paid, you know, all that kind of stuff. But this is, you know, that. That works it out well. It becomes our property as a part of the exactly. breaking you in process. Mm -hmm. uh, and then your next thing, you negotiate a new contract for that. And so if the, if the first thing did well, you can negotiate a, a contract where you have more control over the characters and you can go there. If you're super, super popular like One Piece, say, you can go back to the publisher and say, hi, everyone, I'm going to renegotiate our contract terms. Um, you know, do you want me to keep drawing One Piece? I think you do. Uh, <laughs> you can either take my offer or go stuff it. Right. <laughs> um, so that's what happens with a lot of these you know, long-running super hits where um, Ichiro Oda is one of the, I think he is the richest mangaka in Japan. Um, uh, he, he is very well off. He's like a millionaire. Um, like in U.S. dollars. Um, so <laughs> he's a millionaire in, in, yeah. in, in like yuan, in like Chinese yuan, which yeah. means like twenty-seven dollars U.S. Awesome. Um, so yeah, so that, that's a, that's definitely a thing. Um, and and Jay, you're absolutely right too. You know, there's also the anime and manga adaptations. You know, there are a lot of folks out there who are just drawing adaptations of light novels. Right. Yeah. That's what they do, and that's that's fine. And they're like, this is you know, I, I get to take this fun story and adapt it into manga and do that for, you know, a year or two and great. Um, so yeah, it's an evolution of, of kind of rights over time. Hmm. That's interesting. Is it just the idea of like going to draw with someone else, your character from that got taken away from you and then to go back <laughs> to the people that took it away from you, <laughs> that, you know, that shows, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm assuming an element of like, um, cultural uh, uh, nicety. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, I would think that the average um, Western mm -hmm. artist would say, you know what? Hound salt, I hope you guys like fail mm -hmm. because I'm over here now and I'm going to do this big over here and you guys can go bite me. Thank you. And I suspect, you know, that was probably also one of those things where, you know, whoever made that decision was not working at that company anymore. <laughs> And they so moved like, on. Yeah. Guess what? He had no idea what he was doing. He, he that bad actor, you know, uh, uh, screw him. Come on back to us, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, we, we totally were with you the whole time, but he was the one that held us up. He was the one who made all the decisions. Like, yeah, uh, okay, you know, who knows? Sure, uh, yeah. sure he was. <laughs> money, 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 money. Exactly. Um, mm. and then you have the and so one of the other interesting things about Mom Ben is getting to see like one shonen artist I forget who he, he does some pretty well known thing um, he has four assistants I think um, with him you know working every day um, Junji Ito works alone um, he has <laughs> uh Urasawa asked him, you work entirely alone? He goes, yeah, like my screen tones and shadows are done by the next door neighbors. He goes, what? And he goes, yeah, my wife knows our next door neighbors and they happen to like have the skill to do that. So they are just, so I kind of go over next door and hand them my stuff and they apply the screen tones and the shadows. It's like, all right, works for you, I suppose. Seems weird. Um, but yeah, he is literally alone at home at his thing doing his, his manga, his manga. Um, but if you're doing, you know, um, and they have a shoujo artist who has a, a staff of like five or six, I think, um, she's just turning it out. You know, she's just, she's prolific and she has a lot of, of stuff. She does, I think three series at once. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like three are they vaguely similar or are they like drastically different? Pretty different. Like, um, I mean, they're all like, um, wow. she's like a, a historical shoujo. Um, so like different time periods, different things like that. Uh, now like one's monthly ones in, I think two or bi-weekly, something along those lines, but still. So say if she did, if she did Sengoku collection, I got, I got a letter to send <laughs> to that lady. Cause, uh, um, that's what you know. That's interesting because I, I can think I can't remember what the other than like we keep talking about you know Kokushiko though and, mm. and Shirabako. There was another one where it was 
it wasn't mangaka's assistant but it might have mm. that might have been the title where it was it, you, i keep seeing these things where they're they're showing the mangaka and they always have one to like several assistants doing ink lines and mm. backgrounds and erasing this and doing that and it's like so that would be very interesting to see like just the mangaka doing their thing yeah with nobody around and then providing you know all those manuscript things off to someone else mm -hmm. somewhere else not like literally turning around and be like here you go next sheet here's the next one Do that one um that would be interesting to see it sounds like a, it was a very interesting um interesting documentary do yeah. documentary it, technically mm -hmm. um okay. um and i also actually i wonder now i haven't seen this in the series yet but i wonder how many of them you know ship them off to someone in the Philippines or someone in, you know, Italy. Like, who, anyone can do it anywhere. Well, and certainly, too, with uh, with using digital boards now versus, like, physical, actual drawing. Yeah. I I can't even imagine, you know, that you would – anything other than, like, I'm done today, PDF, here you go. Mm-hmm. And it's off to whoever in South Korea, or whoever yeah. in Shanghai, or whoever in Manila, mm -hmm. and then they finish it out. Well, what's interesting, they they profile—I forget his name—but the guy who does uh, Go Go Thirteen. Um, if you've heard of that one, uh, which is a right. very well known, he's still drawing that manga. Um, yeah, like pen and paper. Yeah, like pencil paper, pen yeah, and paper. Yeah, yeah, um, and he's I think eighty something. Um, and every day, oh, yeah, well, he's, he's not going to change. Yeah. <laughs> um, That's the way he is actually most of the folks they, they cover are pen and pen and ink still, um, surprisingly. Um, That's but interesting. here's the thing. Um, he comes in and he, I mean, he's, he's up there. He's not, I mean, he's mobile, but he's not spry. Um, and right. he draws Golgo, the person. Everything else is done by assistants. So, so all the backgrounds, all the other characters, everything, everything else. that's going on. But he, he says, you know, every time you see that character's face, I drew that. You know, and as much of the body as, you know, makes sense for the panel, whatever. But everything else has to be found out to other people because otherwise, like, there's no way that could get done. Right? Because of just the amount of time it takes him to draw that at his age and so forth. And again, nothing against him. Yeah. He just doesn't have the, you know, the, the, the physical dexterity to do that for, you know, at crazy speeds. Well, uh, you know, and here's, here's the thought too, when you have a long running series that has a great deal of popularity, like voice actors mm. and the, and the Simpsons is a, is a fine example of that. You can't replace Troy McClure. Mm -hmm. You can't replace Mrs. You know, Krabappel. Yep. Mm -hmm. But, it's a big butt. <laughs> Not a big butt. Mm -hmm. um, you have people that have grown up fiddling voices, drawing, mm -hmm. who you've got somebody who's just, they're just doing that thing. Mm -hmm. They've been doing it long enough that everybody else is doing all the other background stuff. Oh, I'm absolutely sure there's more than one of them. That can do exactly that thing. Oh, sure. Yep. And when he retires mm -hmm. or he passes, mm -hmm. that that immediately we get handed off. We're like, okay, here we go. You know, no interruption. We can keep this rolling. Quite possible. And it's like um, for, for those curious, it's been going since October of 1968, and it is um, they most recently published volume 196. Damn. <laughs> so yeah. Um, wow, mm -hmm. that's the interesting thing, and, and and granted, this is an interesting sort of um, dilemma that I know a lot of uh, these publishers face is that because of things like what happened with uh, Mizuki, it's like when he passes away, everyone will know, and so if we put somebody else on that face, everyone will know, and will that be enough of a public relations, you know, not a disaster. Well, a lot of people say, eh, you know, it's time. I don't need to keep reading GoGo13. It doesn't quite feel the same. Um, you know, art, fans will find differences 
this isn't really the way it looks. It might look exactly the same, but they'll still think. The right. publisher might just say, eh, nah, 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 move along. Maybe well, you do other well, stuff, I, but in the universe. I, and I've told you about Kaze no Stigma. That's like that's mm-hmm. that's why that is the one that I use as a perfect example of what happens when your prime artist, character designer, mm-hmm. story, the whole thing, mm-hmm. they pass away. Yeah. The anime stopped. Mm-hmm. It just stopped. It, it it didn't even do a Japanese ending where it's kinda like, <laughs> what could happen? No. It mm-hmm. just stopped. Mm-hmm. Like the very last episode, the entirety of its universe it's wide open. Wow. And nobody has ever gone back to it. Mm-hmm. Because that was that was their thing. Mm-hmm. And to finish it, it's like you can't even sort of get an homage out of it. Mm-hmm. Which I find it's like that's the detail I want to know about RWBY. Now yeah. that Monty Ohm has been gone for a number of years, mm-hmm. is the remainder of RWBY played out mm-hmm. according to what he storyboarded and what he had what he had gotten down before he passed Mm -hmm. or is this somebody who subsequently has said well let's look at the logical arc of this Mm -hmm. you know if you've got a b and c these things will intersect at some point that Mm kind of looks like where he was going and we're just going to sort of ride with that Mm -hmm. it's like which one's better do you just stop and say i respect the artist and i respect the fact that they're gone and now the story's Mm -hmm. done or do you try to respect the artist Abrams. by, you know. Mm. Yeah. You, I, you know, because when you try to do, when you try to, you know, finish the story for the original creator, you get Star Wars 7, 8, and 9. Right? Um, which made a lot of money. No, yes, no, it did. You know, no, didn't, certainly. Um, but also is you know problematic for Disney at this point. Um, and, and sorry, and sorry, Johnny Ruby. Yes, okay, R W B Y Ruby. Mm-hmm. Sorry. Sorry. Um, sorry. <laughs> yes, it, it made fantastic amounts of cash, and mm-hmm. there's lots of merchandising to be done there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, you know when you when you can rescape an entirety of uh, uh, of the Disney MGM Studios for just that thing versus mm-hmm. being a little corner of the place. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> tremendous amount of monies to be to be uh mined out of that so. did i tell mm-hmm. you about the guy who went like opening day of like star wars land um uh i was watching a, a thing and it was, it was just like an interview with folks and this guy said i actually went there and they're like what was it like and he said it was it was amazing because you do feel like you're walking around you know in a star wars world but the um the disney prices <laughs> make it yeah, difficult wow. That I went to the cantina and ordered a flight of four beers, and it cost me seventy-eight dollars. Yep. <laughs> and he said, "And honestly, I am the world's biggest Star Wars fan. This is a man who has opened a bar that looks like the cantina from Star Wars Episode Four. This is the guy, you know, talking about this. He said, "I love Star Wars. I am all for the Star Wars, and I felt soured." about the whole experience just because of how much I was required to shell out for each of these little, you know, parts of the experience. Um, yep. And I'm sure Disney is making money hand over fist, but there, there does, it does feel a little uncomfortable, you know? Well, I mean, <laughs> it's, um, in, in any uh, <clears throat> theme park operation, mm. one of your bigger uh, ways to crank profit is literally by sticking people in a place and then giving them some of them will will take the option to leave and come back. Mm-hmm. The vast majority of them will take the option that you present to them. Mm-hmm. And you know, I mean, there's there's a, a a profitable argument to be said for if you're willing to pay. Twelve ninety five for a single patty and a single slice mm-hmm. of cheese burger, and that was your option that you chose to do that. If you want to pay seventy eight dollars for a flight of beers mm-hmm. at a cantina themed bar, that was your choice. You yep. could oh, yeah, have left. Absolutely, wait, wait, yeah. You know what I mean? And no, it's like certainly. So the 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 magic is always tinged with the reality that 
but it's still a business. They're not here to, to like hug you and kiss you and make you feel good. They're here to give you an entertainment and then make sure that it's profitable enough that they can make that entertainment available to others. Yeah. I mean, the, the, yeah. the downside there is that, you know, Disney is not hurting for profits. Um, no. You know, and no. it, there is That's a true. point at which it feels like they're, you know, they're, they're, they're doing well. It, it's the problem that the parks have had for a long time. You know, um, when Eisner came in, it, you know, legitimately one of the smartest things he ever did is he was fact finding about all this different stuff going on, and they, and everyone was like, yeah, um, the theme parks are like constantly full, but it's really hard to make money off of them. And he's like, okay, what what are you what are you charging for room rates? Oh, we're charging you know X Y Z, and he said, why don't you just increase the room rates by like 20 percent like oh we could do that yeah you could um you know and then it would actually be profitable um and they just had no concept of saying you know let's let's adjust prices to make things actually like be profitable um but then that turned into how high can we raise the prices and still keep people coming um, and the sad, the sad part is that apparently you, it, there is almost no ceiling mm-hmm. because it just changes the strata of the people that are willing to pay mm-hmm. so that you go from sort of a middle strata that people, it's a little expensive, but still functional mm-hmm. to the upper strata that says, you know, hey, this is a lot cheaper than flying around the world <laughs> and, you know. <laughs> Like uh, mm-hmm. hiring hiring an entire island's worth of servants off the coast of India. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it's like okay, <laughs> well, we see where you're going with that now, don't we? Well, this is the frustrating thing is that you know for a long time that was kind of the whole idea of all the Disney World hotels, is that you know you had the cheaper hotels here and then you had the more expensive hotels there. So if you wanted all the luxury, if you wanted all the stuff, you could pay for that. But if you were you know mom and dad and their three kids from the Midwest. You could go here and pay, you know, it wasn't going to be incredibly cheap, um, but it was a, uh, you know, fairly reasonable for that, that, that price bracket. And it just seems to have kept ballooning and ballooning up. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and, the, and the funny part is that it's hand in hand with everything that's around it. Mm-hmm. You know, as much as the, the stories of Walt that he was dismayed by Disneyland, that mm-hmm. in success – had spawned, and I, I remember going to Disneyland as a kid, mm. that it no longer was, you know, as it's, it's read about Waltz, it was no longer driving to what was an orange grove, kind of a little off the beaten mm. path, not terribly, but, you know, mm. convenient. Yeah. And then there's this park. To, there's this park, and then a billion and a half restaurants mm. and cheap souvenir shops and, like, motels and all this other stuff that is like, okay, you know, now Disneyland's entirely surrounded by Anaheim. Mm-hmm. So it's it, it's got and it's the same kind of stuff that Walt had sort of railed against that he wanted to get done. You know, Florida was to have a little bit of space. Yeah. Yeah. Try to go to Kissimmee or Orlando, <laughs> like anywhere within like 10, 15, 20 an hour mm-hmm. from that section. And you have profiteering as far and as wide as the eye can see. Oh, that, I mean... you know. Someplace in Jacksonville will be sixty nine ninety nine a night for a La Quinta. And then you hit about the city limits for Orlando and it's like a hundred and twenty nine ninety nine. <laughs> like, oh what the hell? Yeah. Oh, hold on here. You leave the airport and there are signs for Disney World. Yep. Like, like not Disney signs for Disney World, like, you know, Florida signs saying Disney World, we know where you're going. Disney World Universal Studios yep. is that way. Please deposit your, your 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 tourist tax dollars here. Yeah. Trump. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. They made that a toll road? Huh. That's odd. Why would that be a toll road going between the airport and Disney World? That's so bizarre. I wonder why. Yeah. Yeah. And why would you charge 75 cents? Well, 75 cents like you know, eight, mm. eight, nine years ago. Yeah. 75 cents when no human being typically getting off a plane has three quarters mm. or or any number of pocket change why not make it a dollar and stop <laughs> putting the basket the basket that requires change 
Oh, <laughs> wow. That really, and they're not manned. It's an unmanned oh, yeah. coal booth. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you got, oh, it's just, it's just like, you guys just hate people, don't you? <laughs> it's just like a hate thing. It's, it's um, just awful. Which, um, you know, these will all be interesting things once, once uh, Ghibli Park gets open. Are you going to start mm, seeing, like, get yeah. off, you know, you land in Haneda and you're just going to see Ghibli Park that way. Well, <laughs> like, and, oh. you know, we talk about, you know, the Ghibli Park is not in an orange grove. It's, it's no. you know, it, it's kind of in the middle of things. So that's, that's going to be a thing. Oh, it will be. Mm-hmm. And um, you think that's going to be cheap any part of that it's going to be cheap mm-hmm. like oh no mm-hmm. you can get a hundred dollar watermelon in japan i'm i'm <laughs> sure you know i'm sure that the entrance to ghibli park is going to be really eye-opening mm-hmm. yeah um i'd be very curious to see how that how that works actually in fact they're, in this book they're talking about tokyo disney um disney didn't really believe in tokyo disneyland um that's why the and i'm gonna say this word which i know people I know is insensitive, but that is the name of the company, the Oriental Land Company, um, yep. which was set up was a Japanese company that went to Disney and said, "Please, can we build Tokyo Disneyland here? Can we essentially license Disney to duplicate Disneyland here?" And Disney said, "Sure, you run it. It's it. You know, you make take care of all all operations. We're basically going to license the Disney name and characters to you." And it worked. <laughs> um, and, you know, Disney was kind of dumbfounded. And they said, why, why are you doing this in this, you know, weird rundown, um, literally reclaimed chunk of Tokyo Bay? Um, <laughs> and they were like, because it, it's going to make money. Um, and sure enough, it did. Um, you know, but, but it, I mean, again, it, it, it's, it's that, it, it's money. I guess. Yeah. yeah. It's money. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. If, if they build it, they will come. No. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I mean, and part and parcel of that, too, is like Disney's model for um, out of U.S. parks mm. typically has a holding company operation mm-hmm. whereby Disney is a um, is a part mm. partner. Mm-hmm. And that typically there is a domestic partner, and then there are a, a web of governmental controls and issues that go on with it. So, mm-hmm. and Euro I... Disney has all that. Uh, obviously, Disney Shanghai, China, all this, mm-hmm. like Hong Kong, everything else has this myriad layer of like different interests that are involved in it. That ultimately, in the end, comes down to Disney being like. You do what you do, and we'll take you know a cut of whatever happens. But it's you guys are you're doing your thing. It's one of the things that technically killed um, Disney America from my neck of the woods. No one remembers Disney America. Um, it was a plan to build a uh, Disney theme park in Manassas um, near the battlefields, and actually taking a chunk of the battlefields and building an Americana themed theme park near washington dc and um if you look and see what they were planning it actually sounds really cool um it was gonna be basically like six lands representing different eras of of of, uh american history and um there were a couple of problems um and so people obviously asked so what are you gonna talk what are you gonna do about the like okay we'll get to that in a second um yeah, the uh, the the uncomfortable things yeah. that would happen during certain periods of that. Yeah. Um, so the the issue is that Disney's modus operandi was to go out there and, you know, establish some holding company and then use that holding company to buy the land, and then yep. have another holding company that, that that would you know arrange this, arrange that, and so they did that for a while to kind of get everything set up. Because in Anaheim, that's how you do things, and everyone kind of knows who Disney is, so that you need to be a little bit more discreet so that folks don't know everything you're doing. When word of this got out in D.C., it looked like subterfuge. It looked like Disney was trying to sneak a theme park onto D.C. land, uh, or onto, onto Virginia land. Um, and Disney had some splaining to do. And... Um, what Disney did not realize is that 
DC natives understand this whole thing of, called politics. And they know how to yeah. set up grassroots organizations. They know how to talk to their local, you know, um, civic leaders and so forth. And they know how to organize. Um, and so suddenly Disney had this big fight on their hands. And then, <laughs> with the, and so they were asked. And folk, you know, like Michael Eisner had to go out and like confront these people or talk to these people. They asked, what are you going to do about these like more uncomfortable parts of history? And they said, oh, no, understand. We are planning to address that. Like we are going to have, you know, um, kiosks about slavery we're going you know we're, we're, we 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 don't want to shy away from those topics we are absolutely going to address this and it's going to be clear and in saying that as they explained it it sounded like the disney theme park was going to have a um the horrors of slavery exhibit like right out in you know in, in the front you know in front of the park and people, we were like, I don't want to take my kids there. Why? Are, that's that's not going to be fun. And so that became the story. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> God. Yeah. There's uh, there's something to be said about interventions in Epcot and how like nerdy, kind of educational it was. Mm -hmm. But it it generally doesn't have to deal with like trafficking in human beings and like god awful, you know, like terrible, torturous kind of existence. Mm -hmm. It's more um, about, you know, science. <laughs> exactly. Um, and, and the wow. thing is, um, <laughs> Disney actually, um, and I, I give them credit for this, they actually brought in everyone, all the major people, like the historians and so forth, brought them in for like a one or two day conference and said, here's the thing. We're going to walk you through all of our plans for this park. We're going to show you everything we plan to do so that you understand kind of our intentions here. And they walked through everything. They, they'd spent a lot of time and money on this thing. And afterwards, the folks were basically like, actually, I see what they're doing. And I'm not as, you know, against this as I was earlier. But it's too late. Um, <laughs> like, like, I'm not going to back down now, unfortunately. But, like, afterwards, folks were like, oh, I get it. Like, they, they, they want to do something that is celebratory of America while also, you know, having enough in there to recognize that America is not perfect all the time um, and kind of addressing those things in kind of a respectful, reasonable way. But they went about it entirely the wrong way with the general public. And so you could not, you know, everybody's, uh, you know, minds had already been made up by yeah. that point, And it just, you know, they were never going to go through with it. Um, I was to say, Col Colonial Williamsburg has made it as far as it has mm -hmm. because of the fact that, uh, I don't know, they started doing that in 1930. Yeah. You know what I mean? So they, they've been able to adjust the message mm -hmm. over time effectively while already being there. So for generations, it's already been there. Exactly. <laughs> Versus Disney trying to come in and be like, okay, here we go. <laughs> like, here's, what, here's our thinking on this. Be like, oh, no. American no. history. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, no. Song of the South done. Like, done. No. No. Not something we're all going to want to really enjoy here. Thanks. No. Um, to, to give you an idea, um, one of their plans was that they're going to have a lagoon, obviously, like every every park. And they were going to have recreations of the Merrimack and the Monitor. And they were going to have a fireworks display in the spirit of a battle between the Merrimack and the Monitor. So they would have, like, you know, pyrotechnics going off every night as this, like, giant fireworks show. Um, which, honestly, as a Civil War fan, as a, as a teenager, I would have loved to have gone and see that. Like, that sounds amazing. Um... You know, and it's just, it's never going to happen. Like, there's just no way. Well, I mean, it, it's it's uh, it's it's one of those things where you you get the, the a good ending, you get you get the the, mm -hmm. the happy victory victory ending. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, how do you how do you present the Merrimack uh, without? You know, what I mean, it's kind of like ah, uh, that's the that's the boat from the other side flying any number of colors on the on the boat mm -hmm. and uh, you know mm -hmm. what i mean it's like that would be that, that would be hard to to have that sort of discussion yeah and that presentation uh consistently and and receptively over time exactly um 
I'm watching a series of videos by uh, a professor of history, particularly environmental history, um, but other things as well. And he says one of the most one of the he says the first thing I try to teach my my students is that um, the best historians look at history um, through the eyes of the people who lived through, through history. So, in order for you to truly understand a period of history as best you can, you have to see it from the perspective of everyone involved. So you have to understand World War II from the perspective of the Nazis. And you have to, you know, not empathize with, but see where they were coming from in order to fully understand why they were doing what they were doing, right? Um, well, as, as, a, as a teacher of mine had said in... Um in high school is that you have to understand people in their milieu exactly and you you can't judge them from 10 years 20 100 300 years in the future because their decisions and, and their perspectives make absolutely no sense mm -hmm. and but that's our perspective right um and, and again obviously it doesn't mean that you have to agree with them right um and and that's i think that's one of the one of the interesting things is that i think a historian could make that park for historians and present things that this was their perspective, this was their perspective, these, you know, and all of these things could be done. The general public does not see history that way. <laughs> you know, that is a whole intellectual leap that the average person does not has not been trained to do. I don't know. Po post Big Bang Theory, I think all of us are nerds, so we all kind of get that. <laughs> We're all dialed in like that, right? Sort of? I'm ending this call now. <laughs> <laughs> hey! But It's not um, all about physics and string string theory and, mm, you know, dark matter. Damn it. Exactly. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's fascinating how some things... Will work. Well, Euro Disney is another great example of that. Where they're like, oh, everyone loves Disney. This will be fine. You know? Yeah. And, then, and the French are like, we actually I hate you. We love Jerry Lewis and Bob and Jerry, but we don't like you that much. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. More more slapstick and a lot less mouse. Thank you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, um, and again, it's a good example. From my perspective, we, you know, it, it's it's easy to to trace those those roots. But if you're, you know, a C level executive at um, at Disney, and you say, okay. Who's going to prefer a park? You know, a European country or Japan? You're going to go, the Japanese don't, I mean, they know what our movies are. Why, why would you bet on Japan over Europe? Well, turns out, you know. Well, when you make the little, what, is they, what are they called? Sum, sum, sum? The little stacking uh, squishy characters that look like Dongo. I'm not familiar with I think this. They're, I think they're called Sun Sum Sum or Sun Sun. Okay. Maybe uh, maybe uh, Kira can throw in on that. But it's like mm. a little squishy. So you take Mickey Mouse and you make him into like Rimuru, basically. Okay. So it's like a little okay. roundy kind of squishy little character. Mm -hmm. um, and you can stack them. Okay. That ain't selling in France. Mm -hmm. That's going to sell in Japan. Yep. It's a cute. It's kawaii. You know what I mean? It's this little kind of chibi kind of thing, and that's kind of a cutesy thing. That it just doesn't seem that that doesn't sort of generate the same kind of excitement that that you know that in Europe that it would in Japan. Mm -hmm. So it's like there are a lot of things that you can sort of really emphasize in the cutesy nature of Mickey Mouse, yeah. Minnie Mouse, any of the characters. You can emphasize that comes across in Japan as being like, oh, that's cute, that's that's little, that's something that's that's adorable, and you know interesting mm. to me versus the people in Europe are like, are you insulting me? <laughs> <laughs> like, this has no sense of realism. I, I'm more into Dadaism right now. Yeah. And uh, this I just doesn't, you know. Yeah, exactly. You know, mm. I like the Bauhaus movement, and this just isn't doing it for me. <laughs> There's a quote in the, in the Ghibli book where um, so Miyazaki people claim that Miyazaki doesn't like to travel. Um, actually, he doesn't like press junkets imagine that 
Um, he only likes looking at girls' skirts, so traveling <laughs> is just a matter of like out of the building. Exactly. Yeah, so, but yes, um, but no, he, I, he, says, he says he likes to travel. He likes Europe. He likes all these various things. But he, you know, he's not a fan of sitting in a basement for eight hours a day answering the same reporter's questions over and over and over again. Fair enough. So he's um, like a normal human. He wants to go, go see the Matterhorn and just see the damn thing, not sit in a convention center near the Matterhorn. Mm-hmm. Understandable. Uh, yeah. So when they were doing the press tour for Mononoke, um, they managed to convince Miyazaki, and there's a whole story around that, to go. And Miramax was very understanding. And so they basically said, look, here's what we'll do. You'll do like, you know, a day of press stuff, and then we'll, we'll arrange like a, a three-day tour of Austria. And then you'll do a day of press stuff and a three-day tour of other stuff. And so he, he agreed to that. Um, so they went to a German restaurant, a traditional German restaurant. You know, dark oak, pewter beer steins, the works. And they proceed to lay out a traditional German meal as in a country feast. So you get a leg of pork you know like clearly the leg of an animal on a plate and you get all these various things which led to this conversation uh with miyazaki and and the germans there where they're like yeah you know um uh germans are constantly faced with death by their cuisine uh because they're they've, they've got you can actually see the animal and so we're constantly faced with that. And that's why we have all of these great German philosophers who are concerned with death and life. Whereas the French, like the French, they, you know, they, they don't even see their animals. They don't even see what their, their food, you know, it comes from. So they don't have this, you know, rich, deep philosophy that we have. And... Uh, um, Wait a minute! Don't the French have and, and, and American Dad made fun of this? But don't the French have that tradition of eating like this little tiny songbird, and you have to put like a like a a, a scrim over your face while you consume this, I'm... so that no one sees your shame? Yeah, like that was go. that was that was a joke in there, but it was like <laughs> it was pretty clearly it was a joke about French cuisine. Yeah. So ah, uh, okay, well, let's go yeah. ahead. Um, afterwards, <clears throat> one, or you know, after that conversation. One of the Germans then uh, leaned over to the author of the book and said, um, I should also note that uh, when actual normal, like regular German families eat, they generally eat the French style. <laughs> you know, they, they, they don't eat giant hunks of leg, you know, in their food. They just they cut it up into nice little pieces and eat it that way. It seems the it's Germans... not a giant Viking feast in the in the fest hall. <laughs> yes, you know the, the average German isn't actually all that excited by this traditional, you know, style of food. It's like, uh, uh, hmm. but for Oktoberfest, where everybody breaks out the lederhosen, and they're you know pretty normal eaters. Uh, um, um, but yeah, um, and yeah, and you're right, Seth. It turns out Europe isn't a country. Um, it, uh, and hence the comment that, that for discussion purposes, that was sort of a shortcut to the every, to everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, because the individual, you know, societal norms from from country to country mm-hmm. are, are are enough that it would be, it would be a uh, quite a, quite a discussion in and of itself. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, all right. Let me just skim back over. Um, poor Star Wars Episode Nine only made a billion dollars. Um, let's see here. I'll take ten percent of that if that's terrible. Yeah, Just sure. In small bills, mm-hmm. it, it apparently in small bills it would probably be a lot of trucks full of small bills. Have a Bitcoin. I'll take it in Bitcoin. Hey, there we go. Still be um, several ton, tons of bitcoins, but yeah. So I have a question. Um, we talked in the news about this new Battle Athletes Victory anime. Um. And Battle Athletes is set in this very unusual setting. Uh, but it's got cute girls, cute teenage girls. Um, and I, I've always kind of wondered this about the original Battle Athletes. Um, because they're all competing in a whole bunch of athletic events. Um, all these athletic events that are kind of like the Olympics. Which 
Japan is now hosting in 2021. Do you think they may have been re- they may be resurrecting this specifically for that to tie in with the Olympics? Why wouldn't you? Well, that's the question. Why haven't they? Like, why aren't we seeing, you know, all sorts of anime tied around the Olympics? We had a Paralympics anime. I was to say, but that's that is the the because I remember you showing the uh, the release. And there's a mm-hmm. there's a person who's in a wheelchair and mm-hmm. some other athletes that's all of it i mean that's that's doesn't matter whether it's para or not it's sure. all olympics yeah, it's all no, sport no. Mm-hmm. so yeah, i mean yeah that's that is now why they're not doing specifically battle athletes probably because you have a host of other athletics shows that are out there mm, you know true. um i have i since i'm not a, a sports anime fan particularly mm-hmm. um i imagine there's going to be a baseball there's going to be volleyball there's going to be basketball there's going to be any number of sports that are going to directly have their you know equivalent in the olympics Mm. so whether you know you'll see that on like an olympic venue so the swimming venue Mm. you're going to see free Mm. is that going to be pasted on the side of the swimming venue (laughs) is haiku going to be pasted on the side of the volleyball venue Mm. i don't know but Damn, if I'm those studios producing that, I'd be pushing for that. <laughs> like, yeah, mm-hmm. please. Hey, here's some some cash. Can we put this poster up? Thanks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, bat, battle athletes. It it might not be for the the want of putting battle athletes up, but it might be for the sheer fact that there are other things right now ongoing that they can put in its place. Mm-hmm. True. Yeah, it's interesting. It's it, it's hard to make an Olympics specific anime. I think in terms of plot. Um, because which sport do you choose? You know, you can't make a, an anime about the Olympics because everyone's competing in different things. Um, and if you try to make one about every single sport, it would take, you know, 500 episodes. Um, so it is... Oh, oh, yeah. oh, okay, wait a minute. Uh, Naruto, One Piece, Gintama. How, what, what's your point there? Because just, those, just, 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 those <laughs> last 10 years... <laughs> They can't tie hey, into an Olympics. The Olympics come around every four years. You could just yeah. keep it going from Olympics to Olympics to Olympics. I don't know. I um, honestly, I you know, you're saying that. I, it's just like in my head, I've got this little mini movie of being like, okay, you've got all these people who have gone through all the regional qualifiers. They've gone through their town. They've gone through their prefecture. They've gone through whatever, you know, semi-national. They've gone to their national. You've got somebody from the fencing team. You've got somebody from the water olymp, you know, the water dancing team or you know, synchronized swimming team, and you know you've got like six or seven other Olympians, but not their teams, just them mm-hmm. and their interaction, and how each one's interaction, the interaction of the fencing team member mm-hmm. with the volleyball member, just to borrow Haiku again, mm-hmm. um, that their romance or their competition or their hatred you know they knew each other from such and such and that affects their ability to perform the sport in the olympic mm. there is honestly there's a gold mine worth of stuff to go on there so that the your entire national team with all the different you know disciplines that are on that national team you don't have to deal with you know 10 or 20 people in that specific discipline you could deal with like the single member of representing their one discipline and then tell an entire story about how they interact with the rest of the national team and what kind of like things happen, good stuff, mm. bad stuff. How does that affect their performance? Mm-hmm. You know, it's like uh, that it, it plays really, really well. And why that's not going on right now, I don't know. And I welcome anybody who is, you know, watching the stream that is actually thinking of making this and is in contact. I, I claim rights to <laughs> all, all that. Thanks. The royalty check should be made out to cash. So I can go to the Seven Eleven. Thanks, appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, I I guess the issue is, you know, like Japan fields what thirty different um, uh, uh, or athletes in what thirty different uh, uh, sports, probably. Yeah, and Maybe. that that gives you you can take the top ten. Oh, and oh. run with that. Okay, so I, here's where I think the problem is going to be. How do you choose your top ten? 
uh, you choose that doing a shonen jump uh, total style where you have a survey poll. Mm. You draw people in to submit votes. What characters do you want to see interact for their representative sports? Now, mm. mind you, this also would have been like what? You would have, would have done this like three or four years yeah, ago so that you could have had the lead up time to this moment mm. versus like launching it now where it's like, yeah, we'll do that story in like <laughs> – uh, it's going to be in the four coma manga in like about a year, and then we're going to have an anime in about five. Mm -hmm. But thank you for your submission. We appreciate your voting. Yeah. But you know what I'm saying? It's like mm -hmm. you knew this was coming, so I'm. That's why I'm kind of surprised. Yeah. Like the Paralympics thing, that had to have had lead time. Oh yeah. You know what I mean, so they they had to have prepared that. Mm -hmm. So like I like I've said I I you know I'm just me. I'm sitting here nowhere. And I, I can I can envision mm -hmm. how that anime would run mm -hmm. with all you know different team captains or whatever you want to the lead team players whatever, mm -hmm. and it's like so I, obviously somebody in Japan has sat back and said this you know a few years ago hey 2020 is a big year let's do mm -hmm. this so I wonder, I, I'm really surprised. I wonder if the problem is how to choose your protagonist. Because it's because it, it's rare to have a sports anime that doesn't have that central protagonist, right? Um, so I wonder if it's hard just to wrap. And, so I, I don't mean this to say that you know, a Japanese person couldn't possibly think this up, but I mean <laughs> that um, I I wonder if it's difficult for someone pitching that show to figure out a way of saying this is going to be an ensemble story about 10 different people. There's not going to be one hero and figuring out how to, you know, pitch and tell that story about a large group of people. Um, you know, in a way that kind of, that, that, that works for the genre. Cause I think well, you can, say, it's just, it's just different. But, well, go, go with Konosuba. Um, where you've got your protagonist, he dies. Isekai. Spoilers. Here we go. He is like the, he's the catalyst mm -hmm. for what happens. And it might, he's the protagonist, but he's the mm -hmm. catalyst. Aqua, Darkness, Megumi, Megumin. Um, they are co-equal. Okay. In that they each have their own thing, their own sort of mm -hmm. agency, and he's in there and interacting and blended with. Um, Redive, okay. your ostensibly your protagonist in Redive, the gibbering idiot for like ninety percent of the show, and it's all about the rest of them, mm. and sort of them sort of coordinating together. So now, mind you, getting more than four individual characters mm -hmm. and getting them enough sort of agency on themselves to be to be compelling mm -hmm. is difficult if you chose a selection of 10 characters mm. you know lord love you there's you, you, it, that's that's a thing but you gotta have some amazing writing on that i'm gonna be doable there you go that, that that's how i do it i would say we're actually going to – so I would actually do it a couple of different ways. Uh, I pitch it t two ways. One is essentially two seasons. Season one is five characters, and season two is another five characters. Hmm. Okay. Um, probably linked. Like you know, they, they know each other somehow. Right. Um, or I would say this is going to be – bear with me – a 26-episode anime series, and every episode will be a different protagonist. And it's going to be, you know, an, a completely episodic story about this character's, you know, journey in the Olympics. Did you ever see The Irregular at Magic High? No. It is, I think it's two seasons. Hmm. And it is two or three competitions. Okay. That's it. It's like... All the gear up to, and it's not 
as as dramatically you know amazing as like a Dragon Ball Z kind of thing or you know any kind of you know shonen kind of thing. But yeah. you know it's it that's the vein of it. It's a shonen yeah. thing. They're okay. they're gearing up to a battle. Okay. But it's all these different things going on with all these different characters mm. and some people, you know, competition one. Mm-hmm. Some of these people, gosh, they've done such wonderful things. They're plucky and they lost. Mm-hmm. So the next lead up combat to whatever they're going to do mm. is the people that didn't lose. Okay. And then the third piece is those people. So it's sort of uh, sort of like food wars in a lot of in a lot of respects that you've got a large cast and then you whittle them down as you sort of go on to the to the to the final. So okay. an Olympics kind of thing, you could start out like the first round of competitions, the second round of competitions, and then the penultimate round of competitions to determine gold, silver, and bronze. You know what I mean? It You could do that and whittle down those characters in their respective fields. You know, so that your person that you featured from fencing might not make it. Right. So that you move on with your next group of people, you know, mm-hmm. the person who made it from synchronized swimming made it, the person who made it from judo made it, mm-hmm. the person who made it from biking made it, mm-hmm. but the person that did uh, beach volleyball didn't. Right. Totally. You know what I mean? So you, mm-hmm. you build these things up to get to your ultimate end, whether it's 26 episodes or, you mm-hmm. know, in, in a single shot or like, you know, several seasons, but, you know, your ultimate final shot are those people that have gotten through and they've survived all their respective you know, uh, categories, all their chain up through the, through the championships to be then finally gold, silver, bronze. So you'd have to do like a different Olympics. You have to like restructure the Olympics around it. Well, I mean, I mean, you just, it's almost just turning the camera because, you know, you'll look at like the, uh, the camera angles for any given Olympics. You're watching swimming one day, you're watching floor exercises another day. You're, you know what I mean? It's like when it used to be divided into winter, Mm-hmm. summer and it for you know for the entire winter into into summer olympics that one year you know you watched everything from skiing all the way up to like equestrian right but like you know i guess what i'm confused is is like if you're doing you know the marathon that's one event right but you don't need to run them through the whole marathon you know what i mean that's where you get that nice segue where they start the marathon you've gone through a little bit of training regimen they're nervous they, they don't know if they're gonna be able to do it and now you're on the marathon they launch right they're doing you know the ten thousand meter whatever mm-hmm. something you know marathon length mm-hmm. 26 miles of kilometers i don't know what the hell that is and then you flipped over to the start of the shot put. Oh, so it would be a, a it would literally be wow, that's yeah. tough. Because that but that's how an Olympics runs. You don't have just one event that goes the whole day. You've got multiple things going on. So in any Olympics coverage, whether you know it's live or yeah. even do an anime, you're watching something at one point and then they flip to something else. Right. And then they come back and then they move over here. Mm-hmm. It's like the you know the, the Tour de France we get to you know, there are live streams of the Tour de France where you can watch 24/7 of the Tour de France. Right. Like ABC Sports you watch 3 hours mm-hmm. of the Tour de France and that covers like 12 hours mm-hmm. because they've cut out vast portions of where they're just riding down a you know straight away. Mm-hmm. And it's like they tune in on the, like the big turns, they do its crashes and you know Who's the leader? Who's wearing the yellow jersey? Did they stop? They've had a bike problem. They focus in on those things and then just, you know, cut out the treacle. Mm-hmm. And it's like so. Uh, that's where you know the surprise that not a, a, an Olympics anime is like. Yeah. Wow. There's a lot of stuff you can mine there in mm-hmm. just a handful of characters yeah. over the course of a of a, quite a, a stretch. And then, like I said, their interaction together, mm. just not just not them actually competing. Right. But what happens, you know, what happens to the person from the equestrian team? Their horse is lame. Mm. And the person who is on the judo team grew up on a farm. And they had a horse. I mean, it might be a little, you know, weird in Japan to have that. But, you know, they had or they had some kind of livestock. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, say, hey, you equestrian guy, did you check to see if their hoof has something? Mm. 
da 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 that you didn't look at? You know, have mm-hmm. you thought of this? Because when I was a kid, you know, when I was practicing judo and I had to go help on the farm, you know what I mean? It's like there's a lot of stories that you can mine out of that. But mm-hmm. right now, somebody okay. in Japan is writing all this down mm-hmm. rapidly going, oh, God, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> make it an anime right now. Thank it, you. <laughs> it actually reminds me of uh, Nasu Summer in Andalusia, which is a, uh, a film about competitive cycling. Um, and it is exactly that. It is. It is just the the drama. It's actually. It's more about the um, the pressures of being a professional cycler. Um, you bet. And just you know, you got to win this competition. You got to make money in this competition to you know, and have the, the the contracts and so forth and so on, and keeping in the right physical condition and all that kind of stuff. Um, and not you know have a massive coronary while you're on your bike. Um, right. <laughs> Yeah, there's that too. Uh, um, but yeah, it is, it well, is absolutely that spirit. Well, like Gin no Saji, Silver Spoon. Mm. He is the the protagonist starts off as like that. you know sort of as as twenty six point one or whatever. Oh is yeah, it, I mean, that easily yeah, could be international yeah. as well. So, um, sorry, but Sil- Silver Spoon, mm. uh, the protagonist starts off as kind of a, a not I mean it's not kind of he's not a country person mm. so everything he learns about everything he does is by somebody else who's doing something else doing their thing in their specialty and their interest and he picks those things up from them as they go mm-hmm. so it's like you know what I mean Olympics why not? Why you know? Have, why not have an international team and people pick mm-hmm. things up from each other as yeah. as a human interaction kind of thing? Yeah. I, I guess I I, I, I have a so difficult time imagining a an Olympic competitor who's not an expert in their field, <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but I see where you're going with that. Yeah, that you know, you, you, there can be the the interaction and them talking about you know right. different things. Yeah, but, and, and, I mean, like any given fighting show, it's like most of these people like arguably uh, Ikitosen. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's like some of the people at Nikitosen are like ridiculously OP. I mm-hmm. mean, it's they're just like they could kill you with a single punch. Mm-hmm. And yet there's moments where somebody's like, you know, did you study the basics? <laughs> it's like, wow, I never thought of that. Mm-hmm. I can up my game by studying the basics. And it's like, yeah, you know what I mean? So, yeah, you can be an expert in your field. But there's still a human story that you can tell there to give somebody else sure. a different kind of chunk of somebody else's concept of things that helps you reflect on what you're doing maybe to improve well you know it's it's again it would be anime so mm-hmm. it would be not the the actual world where somebody is just so focused that they're great at what they do see that, that's what i'd love I, I i'd love a realistic olympics anime I, I i would vote for that um but the other thing we could we could you know you could totally go on is the fact that and because we are now you know um a little later on we could talk about this um there's a lot of um, shared beds at the Olympics. Oh yeah. Uh huh. Um, and so I mean, there's gonna be tons of romantic drama. All that stuff's gonna be going on all the time. Um, so you you could you know, <laughs> there's half your story oh, yeah. right there. Um, you can throw your mind back to uh, the Lake Placid Olympics. Hmm. So that would have been what, uh, 80s? Okay. It's uh, mm-hmm. 70s, 80s? Um, the Olympic Village apparently was quite the hotbed for Eastern and Western interests, mm-hmm. having a meeting of the minds mm-hmm. and other things. Mm-hmm. Um, to, to a degree that when you when you go to Lake Placid, you know, they'll, you, you know you'll read various things and you'll see stuff and mm. you know, you hear things about the, about oh. the shenanigans that went on and yeah. that um, it was very difficult for the former Warsaw Bloc nations to keep a lid on mm. their athletes from freely mingling and <laughs> I wouldn't say dis- disappearing, mm-hmm. but not being chaperoned yep. effectively. Mm-hmm. Uh, 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 so yeah, mm, mm, yeah. There's a lot to be said for that. You, know, you have a lot of you know people in their late teens, early twenties, in peak physical condition, 
under a lot of yep. stress, um, surrounded by a lot of other people who are in peak physical condition, um, and kind of wondering what's underneath that leotard. You know, it's I I totally understand. Mm hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 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 that that, uh, that would have for a small uh, Adirondacks town that must have been one hell of a party in its day. Yep, oh, and, and apparently like it's still a thing. Like this is something that they have to yeah. like, really deal with. Um, yeah, again, understandably. Um, but yeah, that. <laughs> oh, oh. I, I, but I mean, I, so mm. so to that degree, I mean, there is. I mean, mm, there is such a mine yeah. to be you know to be dug. Mm -hmm. on just that alone yep. and it's like you know we, we we sort of already kind of get it so it's easy to adapt mm -hmm. any baseball anime where they have to go to nationals mm -hmm. it, it's sort you know even though it's a lot it's the internal parts of most of the team stuff mm -hmm. but it's like you know a lot of those things deal with the same kind of stuff it's like these people's interaction mm -hmm. how different things you know affect their game and how mm -hmm. do they like get their head around what they're doing it's like that's why it why why yeah. are you not doing an, an olympics anime and one of my favorite baseball anime and i won't tell you why and you'll find out um in a minute um is one in which they they get to the big championship game and they lose and that's like the final episode is they lose and they're just crushed um and i send baseball girls <laughs> and there's all this stuff going on and it's it's like wow it's actually not that one it's a different one um Damn. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's like, it, it, it provided the real drama you needed, so to speak for the ending. Like this is, you know, this is what happens. And that's a character building thing. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's always great. Like, a lunchtime watch is mm -hmm. great to have. If you're going to have simple fluff, mm -hmm. like that's why I watched, I rewatched Isekai smartphone. Let me go into another world with my smartphone. It's because it's just so stupid simple. <laughs> it's just I could I could watch it again and be like, okay, there's just nothing going on. These characters are all fluff, and it's just fun. I'm yeah. just having fun watching this. I don't have to think too hard on it. I got other mm -hmm. stuff going on, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. And it's like when you've got something where it's like the end is not just like easily predictable. It's like, oh – you know, the main character has been knocked down and they've got the trickle of blood coming down, but they get up and through the power of friendship now, um, mm -hmm. through 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 their awesome, you know, personal fortitude, mm -hmm. they win. It's like, no, when they lose, that's a greater character study of like, how do you deal with that? How do you internalize yeah. that? Mm -hmm. What does that mean to you as a character? Yeah. Do you fall apart entirely? Are you just, you know, you, you, you're bits and pieces everywhere and inconsolable and nobody can do anything with you? Mm hmm or have you learned that lesson? Yeah. Have you, you know, seen what it means for that teamwork? And that next time it comes around, damn it, you're going to be better. There is a scene that I am going to spoil in Battle of Athens Victory. Um, um, I, won't, I won't spoil it too much. Um, two characters decide to race um, each other. Um because there, there's, a, there's a need for a certain amount of, um, of personal challenge between the two. And um, the competition gets, you know, more fierce than it probably needs to be in that kind of a, a, a race. It doesn't be, it's, becomes less friendly as the competition continues. And it's supposed to kind of realize, and one character realizes the other person's actual skill. And one of those characters breaks her ankle. And she's out. It's over. She cannot compete in these all these Olympics events with a broken ankle. She, she, she it's done. And she has to, you know, exunt from the story and from her, all of her opportunities are gone. Boom. Oh. Um. And it's Is just there are a lot of character character building to that point where you're like, excitement, excitement, well, excitement, gone. More than that is a key player in a lot of the stuff going on. And, and, and it's not like she, you know, completely disappears. Like, you know, people can like call her on the phone and, you know, like she, she can still be right. involved in that, that way. But like, what can you do? Like you're, you're done. Um, and that, it, that was a great way of, you know, adding drama to that story. That all of a sudden that, you know, that person that these people were, you know, either, you know, um, talking to or whatever, that resource is gone now. 
you know, what do you do? And they could have him do any of them at any time. Oh. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, but yeah. Makes me think of a, what is it, pretty, pretty Derby Musume? It's oh, like gotcha. they, they only light. They only lightly touch on that because it's just it's a goofy shit. But they lightly touch on the idea that it's like being injured; it could be the end of it. And you have yeah. like some of the senior characters that like you know are wiser yeah. about how to pace yourself and how to how to do the thing you're doing without well, recklessly hurting yourself. That that's a little disturbing, but. You know what they do to horses that break their legs, right? Uh huh. <laughs> and I think that's the point wow. of why they talk about not being reckless, and they yeah. talk about you know that you know you've got to train, you've got to do these things, and it's just like, yeah, oh. that would be a completely different series <laughs> if somebody broke their foot. It'd be like, oh my, your your character that had been here, you know, for this period of time is like, where'd she go? I don't know. Bang! Oh, what's that noise? Like, yeah. I mean, I find that series creepy to begin with, you know, right off the bat. But, yeah. you know. Uh, oh, come on. Who know. doesn't love horse girls? If you can like Neko Musume <laughs> and you can like Inu Musume, why can't you love whatever horse Musume? I, 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 like? I have no problem with horse girls. I have a problem with how they're presented in the world. Whew. That's a, it's, it's a weird one. That is a, that is a weird <laughs> there's, show. There's, well, there's a, there's a lot of the anthropomorphic stuff that's conceptually kind of mm -hmm. problematic. Mm -hmm. It's like, I know what Doji G you want us to draw. I, I know where you're going with this. Mm -hmm. we, we can tell. We can tell. A um, lonely ranch. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yep. Yep. Um, gosh, sometimes, so the, sometimes living on the sheep station is lonely. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> uh, well, on that note, um... <laughs> I'm trying to think of anything else kind of of note uh, in the news this week to really uh, dive into. You know, the, the Cyberpunk history? Edge Runners, I think, is cool, but what? History? History? Uh, anything no, history notable this, this year? No, oh. no, 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 nothing notable this week that I know of. Um, nothing I come, came across. All um, right. Yeah, you know, Cyberpunk anime from Trigger, it's cool. We know nothing about it uh, other than the, the plot summary, so we'll look forward to that, but otherwise, cool. Um, you know, anytime there's an anime announcement, I'm like, I hope it's good. I, who knows? There's not much else to say. Um, but, yeah. I'm waiting to see whether uh, Tower of God's about to finish up. Mm. So I'm waiting to see what whether they're going to run it the last. I mean, it's got the last episode out of twelve mm. or thirteen mm -hmm. this upcoming week. So I'm waiting to see whether they're going to just wrap that entirely, or whether this is going to webtoons and crunchy roll are going to do something further with this mm. um you know we've uh otome is already gone it's mm. done it's it's run it's run um redive it's either on it's a redive i think it's got one more to go maybe mm -hmm. not entirely sure yeah. um it's like a lot of them are, are finishing up this week mm -hmm. so no idea what that means for Next seasons, whether that means you know we're going to immediately kick off because of the COVID delays, are we? Is it going to finish the ones that are sort of currently running and then bang, we're going to be first of July into the next seasons? Well, we, we have know? we have the dates, so we can just pull up Anachar. There we go and find out. Um, I think most of them are um, mid late July, um, uh, mid July looks like so. Um, 11 days, 13 days, 5 days, 8 days, 12 days, okay. 6 days, 14 days from now. So um, effectively, yeah. we are. We're going to get this We're gonna get this close in this mm -hmm. first week of July, the end of June, and then yeah. it's going to launch in another couple of weeks. Pretty much. To, to days to a couple of weeks. Yeah. Which, as much as I hated all the delays, because I'm still waiting for my damn fishing show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's episode three. I want that show back. <laughs> I want a completion. Thank you. Um it's cute mm -hmm. um you know it it's kind of nice from a fan's perspective to have the time between seasons mm -hmm. is now going to be really short <laughs> yeah. so we'll get we'll launch into the next thing and it's like ah thank goodness now granted 
according to Anna Chart, and I'm I'm sure they are missing one or two things just because of how they count. Um, but I only see 17 TV series on this for summer. And I that's that's 17 more than I would have expected with COVID. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm happy enough with that. There's something yeah. in there. In 17, there's bound to be something in there that's gonna that's gonna strike a nerve. That's gonna oh yeah, be I, something I, to watch. Yeah, it's just much less than uh, than as usual. Um, but like this is not counting Digimon. This is not counting um, uh, the the fish anime. Right. Um, which is just which is well. So funny. so too. Also, there's there's been enough announcements that a lot of stuff that was going to be fall has been bumped to winter. True. Yeah. So my hope is that as we all come out of the COVID stuff and we progress to fa- from phase two to phase three, we move mm-hmm. on and the world sort of you know, comes to new normal. That we'll get this season that'll start July. That'll run us through into August, maybe into September, and then we'll get another break, and then we'll start seeing the, the little bit of fall, and then winter will will hit for the other things. Mm. So that we'll have a nice flow still, after mm. much delay for a lot of the series. Mm-hmm. Yeah, hope so. we'll see. Yeah, if people keep going to Myrtle Beach, we might never get out of this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's that's fine. Uh, that's fine. Um, yeah, yeah, we, we're not getting. Uh any more tower of god next season but we are getting the god of high school so hey which i do what i do want to see all right fair enough um there's a, there's a lot of announcements that i'm like ooh, i'll take a piece of that that sounds fine yeah fair enough um you know what we should do next week we should do kind of a uh what we were looking forward to segment on uh the upcoming season just go through and pick a uh sort of a thumbs up thumbs down kind of a thing on some of these new shows well, we know where the hell I'm going to go with that. It's all slice of life, moe, thumbs up. <laughs> mm-hmm. So we should probably do this new series of horror where it's like gore fest. Mm, thumbs down. <laughs> so what we should do instead, because you're absolutely right. Um, I'd be the same way. You know, I, I know what I like. Um, we should do what we think is going to be popular. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> it, uh what what are the uh holy, uh popular east coast west coast mm. well, the united states the so, entire world okay, so I think japan that's, yeah china yeah, that's good indonesia australia okay. all, right, all right all right south africa all right all right <laughs> um so we could do japan we could do us um we could do i think it's gonna be hard to do anything beyond that because i just don't know what hits in europe you know i don't know what hits in china um yeah, wow I, hell, Japan, it's going to be size on again. But, you know, it's like... Oh, yeah, so we like have to, were, you know, obviously, we'd, we'd, we'd exempt well, those sorts of things. Your um, your list about the most selling and most popular that you show at your panels, mm-hmm. where you're like, hey, you guys heard of any of these? And you <laughs> show a list and people are like, the hell's that? <laughs> Mm-hmm. So that that's going to be a real trick to be yeah. able to like, okay, what's what do you think will be popular in Japan? Mm-hmm. I have no clue. <laughs> Apparently, nothing I understand is makes any sense in Japan. So mm-hmm. um, we should also probably pick like, um, I don't know. I I'd love to do things sort of by fandom. Um, so pick you know what's going to be the big shonen series. What's going to be the big. Um, um, uh, wow. But the problem is, you know, you're, you're only going to have like two or three to pick from um, at, at most, uh, especially when you get it to, the, you know, there's only going to be like one Magical Girl series. So it's like, well, you know, um, so I wonder if there's some other way of, of cutting that down. Um, well, and, and, and define one, one 12 episode, one 26, one OVA, I mean, any, anything one, o- like started- one ONA. I mean, like anything that's starting to air in that season. Okay, so it could be a one-off ONA. Mm-hmm. Sure. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. that's fine. Um, and fortunately, like, you know, Anna Chart shows all of them, so we can just scroll through that list. Um, I mean, we can certainly do things like, um, you know, of the sequels, like what's going to be most popular, like of, of the ongoing franchise things right like what's the big the big deal ishizoku reviewers too 100 <laughs> percent. 
Hyakyu Pacento. Don't don't think that was on the list. That, just just guessing. Which honestly, I'm surprised after how much groundswell there was after the trauma of the of the early parts of it. Mm. I'm I'm honestly shocked. I would have thought they would have been like, "Wow, you love us? You truly love us? Okay, fine." Yeah, but I don't. Nope. Well, I, uh, was there a big groundswell of support in Japan? There was enough that it got pulled from like mainstream television, mm -hmm. and then all these other little bits and pieces started broadcasting it. Yeah, that's true. It's like they started to jump in. It's like by the time it actually finished, you had a lot of little broadcasters. Mm -hmm. Sapporo, Osaka, you you know, Kyoto. You had a lot of mm -hmm. different broadcasters that were not like Tokyo TBS. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you had a lot mm -hmm. of – a lot of places picking it up that wouldn't normally. True. Now, mind you, there's the caveat that once you have PBS say no, mm. if that ends the contractual obligation to only broadcast it with TBS, mm -hmm. that means that everybody else presumably got an opportunity to come to the table. Right. Yeah. So they might they might not have particularly had a great comfort with it mm -hmm. but recognizing that it was getting a lot of talk mm -hmm. they were willing to buy into it because now the property was available and mm -hmm. that you know what do they say and it any, was, any publicity you get is good publicity and it was probably available cheap right like i'm, I'm yeah. sure they were yeah. like anyone who wants to broadcast this please you know yeah do what you want to but for the number of places that picked it up, you know, I, I can't think that they didn't get at least a decent amount of money out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there have, you know, in now I'm not a I'm not a Reddit subreddit kind of reader, but mm -hmm. I, I, I've seen bits and pieces mm -hmm. where there's more discussion going on with Ishizoku reviewers than is like, you know, anime news or Crunchyroll mm -hmm. or any of the other sort of more main outlets of kind of discussion, that there's a lot more sub discussion going on about mm -hmm. it. Okay. So it, it got its controversy yeah. got it a lot of traffic. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Yeah. That, that drives people to do things like, and I haven't seen it yet, and I'm waiting. Not, not that I'm waiting in that respect, um, but I'm waiting to see the merch show up more mm -hmm. you know what i mean it's like i haven't seen anything yet i've seen yeah. some stuff like wallpapers oh. i've seen some stuff like um cell phone cases mm -hmm. but i have not yeah. seen like figures mm -hmm. show up yet so it's better what time was that company what was that organization that started the uh um an online store like a couple of weeks ago and like they had three items and one of them was issues reviewers Ooh. Oh, what was that? It wasn't Momo Shop, was it? It might was have been, thing? yeah. Because um, it was it was hilarious because you you know you sorted by or, or you know filtered by English and it was like three things. One of them was like it was uh, I think a, a body pillow of the um, elf um, girl, elf woman. No, I think it was of the 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 the, uh, the inn proprietress. Um, oh, the 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 bird girl. Yeah, the bird girl. I think it was her. Um, I can't remember her name. It's kind of funny. Um, but I mean that you know I mean that's yeah. one of those things. It's like if that carries forward mm -hmm. and that money you know you can license that stuff out and you can get merch from it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and this is you know now that we're past eleven o'clock, <laughs> I can say this that you're sure as hell can guarantee that a lot of the the hentai stuff that gets made mm. they don't make more of it because it didn't earn any money mm -hmm. you, you know what i'm saying yeah. so it's like mm -hmm. so you should so good reviewers it might not make a ton but you know if they find that this is a a worthwhile endeavor it might do it enough to make another season so it's, I, uh, it's the interesting <laughs> thing is that ishizoku is technically like mainstream h yeah um yeah. and it, it, it's a, it's a it's a nifty trick to be able to to manage that um so yeah, you, you could you'd absolutely sell like legit. And one of the one of the I think smart things about it is that you can totally produce you know the bird girl figurines just you know wearing her outfit right like you you can yep. do totally legit versions of a lot of those characters. Any of them, mm -hmm. because the majority of the characters. I mean, even the slime girl. Yeah. yeah. Oh my god, she's not wearing anything. Mm -hmm. Well, 
Yeah, because uh, she's a slime girl. So Second by it might be a problem, sh- but you know. <laughs> but they're still wearing stuff when they yeah. go in. You know what I mean? It's like are so they? if you wanted to do, yeah, they are. Okay. Like not when you look, not when you look in the tank. Right. But when they they go in mm-hmm. and they talk about the rules and the restrictions. Oh yeah, like the, the girl on the front. The person yeah, yeah, who's yeah. the mm-hmm. door greeter mm-hmm. is wearing things. True. It's only when you look into the tank that things get a little, little, a little intense, a little adult. <laughs> um, but it's like all of them. The mm. the senior elf girl, the senior right. human girl, you know, any given number of them, they all appear wearing clothing. Yep. And it's like, so that's, you know, those are mm. plenty of figures. Yeah. Why would those figures be any different than the my entire beloved cast of K-On appearing <laughs> in bikinis and mm. stuff and doing their little pose things in bikinis? Yep. It's like, I don't i don't want no i want to i want to hear them singing and i want to i don't want to i don't why are you doing this to me mm-hmm. um love live school sunshine mm-hmm. wow i you know i'd love to have all those figures but most of them now are only available in bikini mm-hmm. it's like I, uh, I can't remember where what I, uh, it might have been triad mm-hmm. where they had the resellers mm-hmm. so unboxed like you just got a you know a Ziploc bag oh, yeah, with a yeah. figure in it, mm-hmm. and they had the entirety of Love Live School Sunshine in, I think it was like their Halloween costumes for that wow. concert. Wow! But they were all unboxed, and they were all kind of you could tell they had been mm-hmm. displayed, so that the coloration and stuff was dusty and kind of mm-hmm. off color. Yeah, but it's just and like they were, but they were definitely legitimate. They were definitely no, they yeah, they were full on. They were definitely not. Yeah, I mean, Chinese each character. Not. No, yeah, no, each no. character had its name on the base in kanji and in English lettering. It's like okay, that and the logos were correct. Mm. I think, mm. like, you know, again, <laughs> yeah. you know, like Chinese knockoffs. Um, they used to collect uh, 21st century toys, which you can mm. see a tank over oh, my yeah, shoulder. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, it went out of business years ago. Hmm. And when they went out of business, and I, I tried to find the company to see what the, what happened to their product line, and I read a, a very interesting story that talked about you know the changing market and the, you know downturn. So they had to they they just went bankrupt and it was it. They sold their stock off. They were done. And all of their molds were left at their Chinese manufacturer hmm. sites. So Walmart started to sell their product line under Walmart's badge. Interesting. Because the molds were left with the Chinese manufacturer. Mm-hmm. So, that, you know, I mean, it just started generating things. And it's like, you know, we've talked before. It's like, you know, you really, if you're sending it to a Chinese manufacturer, if you don't, if you're not locking down use of molds and having them sent back to you, you know, these things, they do happen that mm-hmm. people find a way to make all these figures and sell them on the secondary market. Yep. And some of them are really good. Mm-hmm. Some of them have just barely indistinguishable kind of like flaws about, you know, the twinkle in the eye or how the, you know, the sailor uniform, the top, the ribbons painted. Well, and then there are others that are god awful. <laughs> and, and, you know, where do you think all of that stuff, not you, but where do people think that all that stuff gets done? It's not done back in Japan. Like, it's all done by, you know, the, the painting, all that stuff is done in China yep. to their specifications and sent back. So it's not like they don't have the skills to do that. I did watch a, a, uh, a br- it was a brief clip from a Good Smile Company. Hmm. And they actually do some of the Nendoroids oh, in-house. Okay. Oh, cool. Mm-hmm. Um, and really interesting, one of their lead Nendoroid artists, and, and I don't mean really interesting, but I just mm, yeah. con- conceptually, uh, one of their lead artists and lead designers is this re- extremely talented woman. Mm-hmm. And, she, she, you know, she just was talking about, like, trying to get the, the, the eyes right, trying to get the, the, the way that the the face is done and like the rouge on the cheeks and like how many hours she puts into this Mm. to try and get it just right. So I'm, I, my guess is that they do probably some of the limited edition stuff. I think Nenroid had like a, a a 1000th figure Mm. plate. Like literally it was just a plate about yay big. And it said 1000th Nenroid. And it was like, 20 some odd bucks I think it was 2,000 some odd yen 
So they do some stuff in house, mm -hmm. but typically, yeah, once they get the prototype nailed down, they get all the specs down and they detail it entirely. <whistles> off it goes. Mm -hmm. You know, so they're hand done production capacity in house is very very small and does very very limited runs most of it is to produce stuff that will go out as a prototype to then be produced on mass mm -hmm. by a chinese company so i'm going to try to find something here um which would be kind of fun for anyone who's still watching um because i know we're uh, we, we've been going for a little while which is which is fun um I'm I'm enjoying it, but uh, the I actually oh, it's only been three hours. Come yeah. on. Um, the I have a clip here from footage from I think it's NHK. Inside the um, Bondi Gunpla factory. Ooh. Um, showing how they make stuff, um, but I know it's in here somewhere. Um, there's... Oh, and by the, the way, by the way, there's a, there's a ton there of is. Harus, uh, or Haro. Is the Haro the little ball character that you have on your yes. shelf? Yes, that's Haro. Um, there's a ton of Gunpla Haros coming out. Like, one that's oh. like a mecha mechanic Haro, one that's mm -hmm. like just a real simple ball Haro, okay. one that's got like its little feet and little arms out, one that's got like a gun on the back of it, mm -hmm. I... I saw all that. I'm like, wow. I wonder if Brent knows about these. <laughs> so I'm Your minimalist here. tendencies. It'd be yeah, hard to collect all of them. Probably. So uh, I'm gonna uh, cover. Uh, see if I can put this in a place where we can all see it. Um, that's not too. That's not too great. Um, I don't have a good good way of doing this. Um, we'll just slide it over me. To, yeah, it's gonna have to happen this way. So this is the factory. So say bot. Oh. Um, yeah, which is pretty. I think I'd love nice. to go there. Um, <laughs> when you go inside, um, you're treated with a. Uh, this is the entrance door. Um, oh. So it's literally, yep, it's it's that, uh, which slides open. That's cool as hell. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. The uh, the forklifts are all zakus. Um, so you can see the little wow. eye, uh, yellow eye there. Um, if and you they're work all there, entirely robots, it looks like. Is they are. on that? Um, oh. This is the official uniform you have to wear while you work there. Oh. Like you literally are wearing an Earth Federation uniform <laughs> as your standard outfit, standard attire, um, as, you're, as you're working and doing stuff, um, which is just so bizarre and awesome to see. Um, and it just showed them, you know, kind of figuring things out and the various stuff around... Uh, um, um, everything has to snap together, etc. Okay, so here are the sprues. Here, here you get your your sheet of stuff, and here's your metal plate. Um, there's your your form, and then were those those sprues and stuff? They were pre-colored. Yep, that's one of the things that Bandai uh, invented. Actually, they have a four-color process that, oh. that allows them to actually do yeah multiple colors on one. Uh, which is kind of nuts. Um, wow, because I keep I keep seeing the frame arms girls mm. uh, figures, and they like the description of them is that they don't need any painting, mm -hmm. and it's like yep. and yet the picture is of like a multicolor piece. And it's like so that's wow that's how they do it. <laughs> um, Damn. So yeah, these are the actual um, um, machines that, that you know press them out. They have the dyes in them to get the plastic. Uh, and they all have they're colored like doms, because of course. Um, so there's a, there's a plastic, and they can do different uh, things. And as you can see in the upper left, that's gray. Um, so you have a precise mixture of white and black to get your gray, your your gunmetal gray. Um, wow. And this, um, maybe I can get away with showing a, a brief clip of. Yep, there it is coming off. Um, and uh, yeah, so they can do this this multicolored uh, thing on on one sprue. It's pretty pretty cool. Holy crap, that's awesome! Yeah, it's it's, it's nuts. Um, and they're talking about the, the difficulty is you got to make sure that that um, is for lack of a better word um, that that is it, it, it doesn't bleed over. 
right? Right. Um, because then that the next part is slightly yellow or whatever. Um, but yeah, it's, it's something special to their to their process. Um, and this wow, that's is cool. Um, yeah, interview with one of the guys talking about the project model. They have a thing here. Yeah, so they. Um, so this is. Which I mean, you can't you can't get beyond the obviously the painting part of it, but geez, wow, to be able to like get one that's yeah. at least you know seventy five percent the way it should look. That's yeah. awesome. And that's the thing, like that that is, I believe that's an unpainted model. Um, maybe some, you know, fiddling with it. Um, you know, adding some lines there, but that looks like unpainted. Um, but yeah, so this is, let's see here. Yeah, that Zaku on the right, I mean, yeah. geez, that doesn't have that many colors to it. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so there's a model from 1980, um, to give you an idea of the, wow. the complexity there. And then by 2001, they could do this. And by 2015, now they have that much flexibility. And, and that is just standing on one foot. I do not believe that has any support. It can just do that because of all the joints. Wow. So, yeah, pretty impressive. We're that much closer to actual full ba full combat Gundams. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have to wait a little while to see the full-size Gundam. You know, we, we know it's in progress. You know, it'll move. It'll move, but damn it, it won't walk anywhere. It'll just kind of move where it is. Yeah. When's it going to, like, get out, get out of its cradle and go all, you know, Gundam all over the city? Yeah, I I, I I think they're they're waiting to for proof of concept on this one before they uh, they go there. <laughs> well, I was gonna say, you know, I, I I it's being futurist to say it, but it's like it's just always kind of funny to see the conceptual aspects of humankind, mm. where you could take something that's so ludicrously ridiculous as a giant humanoid robot, and you've got one that is it yeah. might not. You know, it might not walk around like right now, but you know, you've, if you've already got it this far, it's a matter of making the uh, the metals for the joints, etc., yeah. to handle the pounding, and then figure out a way for an internal uh, battery pack or some kind of power system that'll mm -hmm. run it long enough. And it's like you, you're already there structurally, so now you just need to do some of the tweaking to get it to where it's got to go. And it's like, damn. Yeah, I want to know how fast it'll move. That's always been the problem. Is is they were like anything of that scale, and it would, it, you know up until recently it has to have to be like pneumatic. They're like it's gonna you know it's gonna take it five minutes to take a step because there's just no way you can move that much weight you know that that quickly. Um, but it sounds like they've you know it can move pretty quickly. They, you know it's 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 not gonna be like a uh, a Gundam, um, but you know. Yeah, but it, it think about F-16s. Mm. You can fly a P-51, mm -hmm. and it's a lot of work to fly it. You know, it's, <laughs> it's cables and wires and hydraulics, and you're you're fighting that machine the faster you go to try and control it. An F-16, it's the computer that's doing it. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that, you know, you're in there inputting commands, and then the computer is interpreting them, and you're, you're getting response from it. Mm -hmm. So it's like, how fast could a Gundam go? It just depends on how fast your processor is because you have well, to gyro stabilize the entirety of the structure. It, if you can gyro stabilize fast enough, it could walk. But it, well, you have to be able to do that. Yeah, and, well, and, and, and the issue too is just yeah, um, having physical processes that can move that much metal that quickly. You know, just you, know, you look at a car crusher and like it, it's not fast, right? <laughs> Um, no. So it, it's figuring out all those things too. Is that like there? There was nothing we had. But I mean, could... and a car crusher doesn't involve that much complexity. It, it doesn't have mm -hmm, to right. have that much processing. Mm -hmm. If you're going to have a Gundam walk, every step it takes off of center where it's grounded, mm -hmm. you have the gyros are working to figure out where it is in space and time, mm -hmm. and then you have all the computational aspects about okay, what is forward momentum and what is forward motion. Mm -hmm. So not just, you know, the physicality of, you know, pick the leg up, move it forward, but what's the momentum of the mass and right. where does the center of gravity shift? It's why and Boston, it's like, you know, it's why Boston Dynamics is so, you know, so revered by people because they're like, they figured out how to walk like that. That is an incredibly hard problem like that. that, you know, that is bipedal, a mo problem. bipedal motion is big 
incredibly complex thing. Mm -hmm. And and you're right, so yeah, like, you like, know, the original idea is that these would be space only, that they really could not work in gravity because it's just, it's very complicated. Um, yeah, that, that, that kind of makes sense. Um, and and in fact, they, they say in the first episode that you know. Um, uh, they they make the point to have Amaro say it's all computer controlled. It has all these computers. That it basically drives itself. You're just telling it where to go. It's like ah, because you know there's no way a pilot could actually figure out. You know, okay, yeah, foot goes up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the ones uh, the ones where it's literally a, a bio or a bio integrated suit. Mm -hmm. Um, it there's no smart function to it. It's like that just just the idea you can't you can't do one for one mm -hmm. so if you set me in a giant giant machine and said yeah. okay it doesn't it doesn't do anything it's just it totally mirrors you it's like yeah but i also don't weigh like 20 exactly tons right yeah so you know i'm not even really all that stable on my own feet on a good day so mm -hmm. give me 20 tons worth of steel and other things flying around me yeah i'm going to fall down there's a great moment in ghost in the shell in the, uh, the um, appendices, the huge appendices. Appen appendix? Oh, yeah. It, it, it has Appen appendix. appendicitises? <laughs> um, no. Was it there? no, it must have been a side thing. Because um, he would do these little things. Maybe he's not in here. Maybe it was a. Uh, um. um. Um, there's a little uh, a note that he made about the problem of cybernetics and of, of, of cyborgization specifically, um, where he said, "Here's the thing. Let's say you create an artificial arm that can um, uh, contract at five times the strength of a human. Not hard, right? You have you have have the, the, the all that stuff, and you graft that onto your shoulder." And the person goes and grabs something and contracts the arm and contracts the arm. It then rips out of the shoulder because the shoulder, the, the muscles and tendons of the shoulder are not as strong as that, you know, contraction, contraction right. movement. I gotcha. It's so, anchor point is less is less durable than the actual <laughs> machine itself. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I got it's, that. It's, it's one of the, the the big problems practically of 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 making a cyborg is that you kind of have to do all or nothing. You know, you kind of have to have a completely cyborg body. You can't really do half and half unless you do what folks do like for um, artificial, like an artificial leg where you are replacing a specific portion of the body and you're not trying to go beyond what the body can actually do. You know, it's basically a support structure. You're not, you know, um, making that leg do more than the leg is supposed to do. Um, so you're saying you're saying Steve Austin when he's running right. like 90 miles an hour and his biological leg flies off mm. <laughs> somewhere because his bionic <laughs> leg yep. is going 90 miles an hour and his regular human leg's like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> exactly, yeah. Aha! I see the vlog playing now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting. They six, all million, six million bucks. Are you going to yep. solve oh, that problem? All gone. All gone. <laughs> Um, cool. All right. I think that will do it for us for tonight. Um, great conversation as always. Let me just double check on the lists. Nope. I think that is, that is about it. Um, all right. Yeah. Thank you all so much for being here. Appreciate it. Um, Eat. been a good time and, uh, yeah. Thank you all very much. Hope you guys have a great week. Oh, but wait, before we leave. The, we, we have a question. What did we learn? What did we learn, what on, did the we learn on the show tonight, to friend? What did you learn tonight, JJ? That cybernetics can leave your limbs flying off. Mm -hmm. um, this is true. No, I, what I learned today, mm -hmm. night show, is the fact that we have not yet heard about the ultimate or penultimate Olympics anime. True. Covering different sports uh, 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 specialties. Mm -hmm. But it's coming. Yeah, We know somebody out there is working on that. So that I learned mm -hmm. that you can't ever limit yourself to one particular sports genre. Yep. It can cover ma many different things. I agree. Um, I've learned that culture is important. And, and 
being aware of different cultures can can avoid embarrassment. Um, let's see here. Um, I've also learned that sex sells, apparently. Didn't know that before. Apparently. <laughs> oh, uh, you've never heard of Hugh Hefner. Oh, okay. Eh, seems familiar. I don't know. Seems like a guy who I might have known. Mm -hmm. um, I will at some point tell you a story about that. Um, um, that you're it, Hugh Hefner's son. Wow. Um, I, I, I will. Mm, this is something that. Mm, <laughs> Wait a mm, minute. We say mm, that tells me yes. Mm, no, no. But it's 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 a. Mm, um, I have to be careful about how I how I phrase even explaining it. Um, I've I've learned that online anime cons are still a thing. Definitely. Um, you broke ground, and I, here they all are behind you. I, I can always claim that I was first. You know, I I was the pioneer. Um, I also learned, uh, uh, as Jay says, Kazuno Sigma will never continue. I know. Yeah. I loved Kazuno Sigma. It had such a good storyline. It was going to go somewhere. Yeah. <sighs> but more anime is coming. We have we have summer to look forward to. Um, so we can all look forward to that. All right. Thank you all so much. Hope you have a great rest of the week. Until next time, watch more anime. Until we see you.